The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this light go. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. It is time to keep your appointment. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 144. My name's Gav. And my name's Dan. Welcome. Your guides through the uh, world of dirty, dingy, 80s New York trash. And yeah. rats. So, uh, segue straight away. Um, there we go. Got rats in my loft. There's not a that, goat man. That's what it is. It's not a goat man, it's just a giant rat. There's, uh, there's a lot of rats up there. The other night, it kept me awake. It was like a party. It's literally like there's like, or a rat orgy. I don't know. I was like, fuck's sake. I'd hate, I'd hate to be involved in a rat orgy. Unless I was a rat, of course. Well, 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 it's just a regular orgy for anyone else, really. Whatever f- thing it is, you put orgy to it, it is still what that is, but multiple variations of that, doing things and putting things where things sometimes don't go and sometimes do go. Wow. We've, so we've kicked off with rat orgies. This is great. But yes, you're right. New York is full of rats, and we're going to be discussing New York a lot in this episode. We could call it the, uh, the episode <clears throat> Rat Orgies. Rat orgies. There we go. Well, so that'd be, my, that'd be my punk trash trash punk band. Rat orgies. That does sound. Just rat orgy would be rat orgy. the name. Yeah. Um, so for this episode, yes, we will be travelling to New York in the early eighties. And as you've seen, if you've clicked, you know we will be covering Basket Case from nineteen eighty two and Chud from nineteen eighty four. Two films that, and we'll get into this, but two films that kind of always sat out on the shelves when I used to go in the in the video store and, and you know the, the covers of them and the, you'd wonder well, what's this about them what's it going to be um they rely on some special effects or practical effects uh so yeah we're going to be discussing those they're our main reviews but we'll also be talking about new york um the, the, york. You know, the, the york, york. The, crea- the weird hot pot creativity that is new york especially in the early 80s and all the stuff that happened we'll talk about some films that you may want to watch to get you in the mood if you like your, your new york movies your new york horror movies um and some some creature stuff as well from this sort of period because this is you know before 85 so it's that nice sweet spot between the late 70s and early 80s uh mid 80s where People were just... We talked about it before, Gab, but you've said, you know, the, the, the effects guys were the rock stars at this point. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you could pull off some great effects, you would get the ladies and the cocaine. Um, yes, especially 80s, 80s New York, very much crack and cocaine. Crack and coke. Crack coke, baby. Uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing today. Um, quite an interesting one, really. Kind of, uh, we've, we've delved into sort of New york type films before. And I've always liked, you know, for me, when I first got into hip hibbity hop um new york was like like you know where some great hip-hop was coming from and it's always like i've never been there i'd love to go there but like you know beasties came from there and there just so so many cool things yeah such a cultured place and uh, it's, yeah, it's a hot pot i hate to use the term but it is a hot pot and uh yeah and certain movies and you know the, you know the look of these movies we're looking at today kind of also like driller killer things like that yeah, we'll yeah. get into all of that, definitely. I've been there twice, so I'd like to sort of share some of that as well. Um, but yeah, so before we before we head over to New York, yeah. how are you? What have you been doing? What on earth is going on uh, in your life? Uh, not much, the normal stuff, really. Um, I, I was wondering, still trying to de- delge into what? Delge. What's the name? Delge? Delge. It's a new word. New word? what um i should do for my birthday um i think you know episode and i still think i will so i was watching it just before i came on um i think i might do it it's that or something else but i'm not sure but i still think i'll do it which would be studio 66 um one thing i think i'm gonna do i think I'm, i think we go there i okay. think we do it yep are you making the decision live as we record i think so otherwise i won't commit to it 
So, Excellent. So that's the the, the sorcerer. Yeah, the, yeah, the sorcerer. Of William Friedkin. And Studio quite an old, older film. Yeah, and the Studio sorcerer is going to be a really good conversation. And I'd love to have done something like the Holy Mountain, but those two are both fucking deep movies. Like, oh gosh, heavy, heavy shit going on. Um, and I don't, especially Holy Mountain. So I, I've picked something to go light. And I thought Studio 666, because it's also Netflix uh, recently for, I know UK, I presume, uh, um, stateside and uh, uh, the rest of the world as well. Um, so everyone can sort of watch it. So it's always good for people because Sorcerer, uh, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Yeah, cool. Um, and, it can, isn't, and it isn't about a sorcerer. So. I know, I was kind of cussing Spoiler about alert. it because I thought it was <laughs> going to be, but yeah, no, it wasn't. But it's actually kind of cool. I did go to the cinema, though. Ben and I went. Um, the other night we went and watched Thanksgiving, Eli Ross Thanksgiving. Oh right! Please tell me. This is the first I'm hearing about your your views on it. Tell me and our listeners what you thought. No spoilers though. Um, no, I won't. Um, well, it's it's funny because I was kind of like actually, you know, it's Eli Roth. I've kind of not moaned about him before, but he's kind of like Rob Zombie. They can him and Eli Roth. Well, they're buddies, aren't they? Yeah, well, I expect they're all older horror directors. They could both really make a film. They know how to make a movie. And they both absolutely adore and love horror. Um, And Eli's almost like a a torchbearer in certain aspects of horror. Like doing his own Eli's um, horror uncut show or whatever on AMC, you know, um, or... Yeah, it's a great Shut show, up. Eli Ross' History of Horror. Yeah, it's stuff called. like that. So he really like a torchbearer as such, a real ambassador of horror. And um, and, and like all of a sudden, you know, he, he starts off cabin fever. And I was I was sort of premiere uh, in the UK at Fright Fest and just like, what the fuck is this? This is great. And he had a little video introduction. And straight away I was like, this dude, love him. And I'd never seen him before. Then, then Hostel, and that's obviously torture porn, like almost opening up that into a very wide market. Um, doing that yeah that was the first real proper yeah and it's a great film you can watch it oh, it's in my collection I'll watch it now and be like yeah good film and then um, obviously doing a couple of bits of bobs here and there but then all of a sudden like doing a cannibal movie which is just yeah. a bit like left field because like no one's doing a cannibal movie the, no the, the Green asking. Inferno yeah, the Green no one... Inferno for anyone who wants to watch that and no one's asking for a cannibal movie but he did it and you're like fair play man it's it's alright it's okay if you into cannibal movies but it's like yeah fair play man to you um, so so I was kind of getting around to it in a very long winded way I was kind of excited for this because it is his look into slashers and I know he's a massive slasher fan of like pieces and movies like this um so i kind of did enjoy it i didn't bother seeing anything or reading anything apart from the original grindhouse 2007 grindhouse trailer and if you don't know what that is that is when tarantino and uh robert rodriguez both made two films and put them together as a package and it flopped unfortunately as a double package um, I've got the Blu-ray of it as a whole massive thing with all the fake traders, and there's these fake traders by different people, and Edgar Wright, Rob Zombie, uh, and Ilo Roth did one called Thanksgiving, and that trailer had like the lady coming down and doing the splits on the trampoline, the knife going into her, into her, <laughs> yep. Um, um, beans are being in a minute. I've got my dog with me today. Yeah, don't don't whistle. Sorry, I yeah. won't whistle again. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like what? No, mate, he's too old, he's too old, he's tired, he'll be sleeping. And that, but there was a girl on a trampoline, but they they did the do the knife, but they didn't do that at all. And they shied away. And it's like, oh, that's a shame. Mm. But there was some real good gory deaths. I wanted more gore. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. I wanted more because he was doing like a love letter to 80s movies. And there's zero tension, not one bit of tension. Uh, which was kind of a shame, but it's kind of like, well, what was he making? Like when he did the cannibal movie, he was making one of those cannibal movies. This movie was him making like an 80s slasher movie coming from this ridiculous kind of grindhouse trailer. So I can't expect uh, uh, um, a masterpiece of cinema, which is good, you know, going the history of 10 greatest movies of all time. But like, I, I, it's, it felt like almost a shame that he couldn't have done a bit more tension to it and actually pushed that a little bit further. Do you know what I mean? He was yeah. there. I think he was on the wall when he could have just gone a little, a little bit further and been like, whoa, this well, is a good when movie. You've got, when you've it's got direct- fine. When you've got directors making things like Bone Tomahawk, Drive to Cross Concrete, that director, I can't remember his name now off the top of my head, um, People can push it, and, and those films do do well. They might not m- make a huge commercial amount of money, but they're great films, and you can make very violent. And I'm not saying you know we're okay with classics. Yeah, exactly. But you can make a really gory, you know, X or an old school X-rated film if you want. Um, 
And my prediction, when we discussed this in the last episode, when this, this film was about to come out, my prediction was, from reading the early reviews, is that you, you, I, and other horror fans would probably like this, but it probably won't be gory enough for us, but it'll be it'll be a nice little 90 minutes where you can just watch it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I think people who aren't seasoned horror fans will probably think it is quite gory. Um, oh, yeah, of course. There's a couple of old people in it, which is amazing, but one of the old guys actually got up halfway through... <laughs> <laughs> went over to a woman who must have been using her phone and is having words with her and then she's like yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. then another woman her his wife must have been went over and they're quite old and ben ben was clapping nice um because because ben who i was with obviously you know ben from who filmed um sanctuary moon which i hope everybody's watched now star wars sanctuary moon dead bolt youtube go and check it out just um, over nine thousand views as we speak keep watching uh, it very people uh here's the one who, who's in the cinema at the time and ended up having a fight with someone because their phone was on I think I said it on here before possibly he was in a cinema once someone's looking at their phone it pissed him off so much he went over and he took their phone and put it in their drink oh my god so I, he started having a punch up with the guy and he dragged him out of the cinema screen and then came back in and sat down and watched the rest of the movie <laughs> I mean, I've had words with people. I've had arguments with I people. I couldn't do that. I've never had a fight I, I remember. I remember watching Jason X oh, with yeah. my friend Rob. You know Rob. And there were some kids in there that were talking all the way through it. And although it was just the Jason movie, I went over to them and I said, right, are you all going to give me my money back? And they looked at me and I said, are you all going to give me my money back? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, we've all paid to watch this film, but all I'm hearing is you, you guys talking. So unless you're prepared to give me my money back, shut the fuck up and let us the rest of us in here enjoy it and i got a bit of a clap from three or four people in there and i rob was rob hated it he turned into a turtle he put his head down into his shirt he's like why did you do that i said because because i'm sorry i was trying to enjoy this film and i got these dickheads chatting away and another guy i remember another film i was in a guy was using his phone and listening to music and then he lit a cigarette and I, that was the point i stood up and i went I, I think i knocked the cigarette before he lit it out of his hand and i said are you seriously about to light a cigarette I, you know i don't care if you smoke i'm not opposed to smoking but we're in a cinema i'm about to listen to your music playing off your phone what are you thinking and i afterwards, was he pissed? Like, no no he was like a young lad he thought he was a bit of a gangster I, outside him and his mates came over and tried to have a word with me and i just said i can't remember what he said now i was i was younger i just said shut up or something you know get get out of my face they'd know you nowadays these days they would sadly or if it was in america you know that guy in the batman film they'd you know. you and film it yeah but yeah. on tiktok <laughs> uh, anyway Why? so thanksgiving um uh yes. yeah i wish it had been more tension i feel like it outlived its welcome a little bit but at the same time i was happy to go to the cinema as a horror fan who loves slasher movies to watch uh thanksgiving but it's not like april fool's day or halloween or friday yeah. 13th it was a themed movie and i'm kind of hoping there isn't a part two because there's no fucking no need to be one it should just be a one and done and that is it if it, I don't know if it done well. Fair play. Hopefully not. He Fair doesn't play really in cinema, but he has got some tout with uh, his name. He tout. doesn't tend to do many tout. sequels. Tout. I mean, Hostel Two and Hostel Three, but he was only really a producer on those. And then um, Cabin Fever got two sequels and then weirdly they remade Cabin Fever like only five years after it came out, which I, I don't. I think I've seen the no, remake. Uh, I think they remade uh, actually Eli's exact script, uh, it's very uh, but, that, but after there was a remake or something, I can't remember. Something well, weird. I'm or part I'm, two. I'm a fan of Eli Roth, um, as you know, Is for the most Toy part. West, you didn't realise? Yes, that's right. And he's tried to have his name taken off it, and he can't uh, do it. Hilarious. Well, I link in that director to another director that I'm a bit of a fan of, and a lot of people think he's a bit up his own ass, but I don't mind, is Kevin Smith. Um, and I watched, finally, it only came out last year, but I finally got around to watching Clerks 3. Um, I don't know if you've seen Clerks 3. No. no? Okay. Uh, really? I, I, I don't actually... I don't, is it a new thing? Yeah, 22. 2022. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, so I only just watched it last week, and I was really, really into it and yes it is uh, very self-referential as all of kevin smith movies are but i know that and that's why i kind of like them and this film is about um 
uh, Dante having a heart attack, just like Kevin Smith did. This is why he wrote it, because it's all about having a heart attack and reviewing your life and sort of thinking, shit, what am I doing? And then Dante and... Um, uh, well, I can't remember his friend's name now. Um, the other one with the goatee. They end up... They're going to make a movie about what it's like to be working in a, the clerk's shop, you know. And it's kind of very self-referential. But it's good. And it had me crying at the end with some stuff that happens. And it's definitely the end of those sort of clerk's movies. And I love Kevin Smith. People often slate him. But I think when he first came out, he was like so cutting edge. And his his writing is incredible. And maybe he lost his way a little bit somewhere in the middle, but I'll always go for, go for him. So a bit like Eli Roth, I, I will always check out anything Eli and and Kevin Smith do. I do like those guys. So yeah, I just wanted to mention Clerks 3. Um, thought that was a really good movie. Um, the only other movie I've watched, really, uh, it's worth mentioning. I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, it came out in 1982. Um, it's a bit of an old one. But I sat down and watched the film uh, by a director. But what's his name? John Carpenter. Yeah, The Thing. Have you seen The Thing, Gav? Not seen it. What's it about? Not heard of that one, yeah. Oh, it was a bit boring, to be honest. No, what's um, it about? It's about an alien. Oh. <laughs> no, um, I'm, of course joking it's a 10 out of 10 film and i rewatched it because it's been about a year probably since i've watched it I, and all i'll say is because we've all we've reviewed it and everybody knows what the thing is but that film honestly honestly it, it gets better and the more i watch it the more i realize just how perfect that film is really you know okay yes it has flaws only because it's aging and some of the effects don't hold up quite as well but at the same time no one was doing anything like that in 1982 and that the story the characters the acting it's just i just get sucked into that world within two minutes of the credits rolling and man it's just the weather's turned and it's one of those films you put on when it's a bit snowy or a bit cold and mm. I just wanted to mention it because you know we yeah, love it. That's all, we love yeah. it. Yeah, cool. I've um, actually put up my Christmas tree already, and it, uh, the weather has turned. It's really cold. I'm in my dressing gown. Quite often, I'm here topless. Not that the listeners can see these things in the summertime, but I thought I'm going to go. Well, I class it as Hugh Hefner because I've got a pink light on a cardigan. Uh, uh, sorry, dressing gown. Um, you do looks just like him. Yeah. I did, do I? No. He's dead, isn't he? No. Um, that's the only couple of movies I wanted to talk about. Other than Thanksgiving, is there anything else you, you've watched or you wanted to talk about? Not really. And we recorded. Oh my god! Only last week. So yeah, there's a, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to get the fuck into it. Well, let's get into New York. So before we have our first trailer, and um, we're going to talk about Basket Case first of all. Just wanted to talk around New York, um, spe- specifically New York in the early '80s, and then I've got a few recommendations for. New York set horror films and early 80s creature features for anybody who wants to get a taste of Basket Case and Chud and if you if you like those movies and you want some recommendations and you probably would have seen a lot of these anyway but but first of all let's talk about New New York can you do your New York accent please Kevin? New York <laughs> can you can you say can you give me that coffee please um give me that coffee <laughs> Wow! What? Hey, give me that coffee! It doesn't even sound like New York. It sounds like I was trying to go more urban or something. I'm walking here. Hey, oh, Chris walking, yeah. You guys, I, I always go a bit. No, I always I'm go a bit even. Italian, Italian mafioso with my New York oh, no. accent, really. Or I go quite Jewish. It's, it's one of the two. It's I hard need, to do. I can't see. This is the thing. I can't just be like I'm um, performing monkey with me impressions. <laughs> I, I need to like watch something, and then what I do, I'm like a parrot. I watch it, and I'll just start working it and working it and working it, and then I'll get exact sort of tone and uh, and the reflection and stuff. I can't, but I can't throw it in like I'm a dancing fucking monkey. Oh well, you'll always be a dancing monkey to me. Oh, dancing um, monkey. Well, let, let's talk about New York first of all, um, just very briefly. So. In late 70s, as covered in Gab's other podcast, um, you had quite a lot going on in New York in the late 70s. Uh, you had the Summer of Sam, uh, or the Son of Sam. Um, you had all the blackouts. You had rat infestations, trash strikes, uh, riots, murder. You had the Guardian Angels, vigilantes. So New York is literally... It's like... You couldn't write it really and some of the movies that came out like warriors and stuff like that they are all sort of there is a little bit of truth to some of these movies um in some ways but obviously 
Go on. If you want to uh, do check that episode out, it's episode 66 of the High Strangeness podcast. Even if you don't want to listen to any of the other ones, uh, check that episode out. We sort of really went in and talked about the whole trash thing stuff. We're going in looking at the 70s with Son of Sam and Killer and stuff, uh, where the movies today and the crack and the coke and that. And, and a lot of the things did still carry on flowing through, like the trash problems and stuff like that. It's obviously just one of those things uh, into the 80s. But that episode's on the 70s if you want to check that out of all New York and the, and the weird stuff going on and the killings and the shit like that um, and the guardian angels and like you say um all that stuff did sort of spill over into the 80s um uh, well well what you're going to end up having is um uh just i'm not you know, i'm not saying it, it possibly and possibly not the cia uh, uh bringing uh crack and coke into the New York and just then dropping it into the areas where they're, they'd already been like no we don't want to go there you you police it yourselves with all the gangsters and all the all that shit and just it just then went but then you also had the Wall Street boom as well and then the cocaine involved with that I'd just watch Wall Street with Charlie Sheen you know so um, it's a weird it's a weird time 70s and 80s in New York very strange time and then so you had movies like this what we've got coming out yeah, and so to paint a picture of New York itself before we look into horror films and stuff, New York in the very early eight to mid eighties, it was just so there's a lot of originality and creativity come out of it. Hip hop, although hip hop was born in the late seventies, really came out proper. You had Run DMC, Beastie Boys, you had Big Daddy Kane, you had Rakim and Eric B. You had hip hop was really becoming this underground creative platform um the, the fashion you know uh, uh, the, the slang the way people spoke rap the dj all that stuff you had um and sadly some linked into that you also had a bit of a crack epidemic that was still spilling over aids was reported for the first time in the eight very in like 1980-81 um and that was a big thing in because everyone was quite free with their sex it, 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 until age kind of reckless scene. sort of uh, uh time as well yeah when when, uh, when the knowledge about started coming around of age that it's still being slightly reckless at times well i think i think the word i would use gav is excess there was a lot of excess and there was another you can look at yuppies because the yuppie culture came out of the early 80s cocaine yeah. having money driving around in sports cars so there was a real divide between the poor and the rich um, there was a lot of urban legends which we may or may not get into for World of the Strange oh. uh, as well because New York is a big very vast city with a lot of people living there um, of all types of life all backgrounds religions colours creeds sexes and you can be a very rich man like Donald Trump was, you know, living in New York, or you can be an underground rapper who's got no money, but everyone in your your hood respects you because you're you're well known. And and or then there's be yeah. uh, someone that actually lives underground. And there's, yeah, uh, there's well, that's Doc Days, a really good documentary, um, a music by DJ Shadow of about the people that lived underneath the uh, New yeah. York under actually underground because it's cheaper and it was uh, they felt safer and they made a little city under New York, which is crazy. And that's what I find so fascinating about New York. It, it is literally from the from underground all the way to the very high skyscraper. There's so much activity, and it, it really is a city that doesn't sleep. And like I said, I've been there, been there twice. I went there um, exactly one month after 9/11 happened. Um, sadly, um, we wouldn't have gone really had we been able to cancel all our holiday. But we wouldn't have. We would have lost a lot of money. Um, had we done that, so I we, had two we still different went. groups of friends and were, uh, on were at New York, and I live from Farnham. Oh right, and they were in their windows watching it. Yeah, I spoke to a guy. Um, I may or may not have bought some weed from a guy in uh, Washington Park, um, which is very near where um, the trade centres were, and I asked him um, what happened on the day, and he said he was smoking a big joint, and he saw the first plane hit and sat down finished the joint and then the other plane hit and he put the joint no he, he said he'd almost finished the joint the second plane hit he put the joint down and he thought and he didn't smoke for about a week after that because he couldn't quite get his head around what he'd just seen um and it was a very eerie time to go there um it was still smoking actually four weeks after there was still smoke coming off of the of ground zero It was crazy so i went there then but then uh, i also took alice there about 
11 years ago now, one of our first holidays together, uh, I came into a very small amount of money, nothing to write home about. Um, and I was able to treat Alice to a really lovely holiday uh, in New York for a week. And we went there then and we experienced what I would say real New York, a very, you know, um, lots going on 24 7 those fire engines whizzing past people chatting in the street everyone's got energy and excited and it's also a little bit dangerous but also you know it's just it's just all going on there and it's it's a great city to visit um just be i would say be careful obviously like with any big city there are areas you probably wouldn't want to go into and you would want to stick to the mainly the touristy bits but it is a great great city and it was fantastic to be there and see things like statue of liberty and all these monuments and areas that you've seen so many films you know going to central park how many movies have been set there you know highlander ghostbusters so many um but it's a great city um and obviously another reason i loved it was like you said gab new york um hip-hop was kind of born there really um so it was great to sort of see all that and the, the murals it's and a very good uh, skateboard scene as well yeah it's i mean there's honestly a scene whatever you're into there's oh, a scene for it there as well yeah, yeah. honestly uh, it's breaking. all there yeah yeah uh, all right, cool. Um, so, so that's New York. Um, yeah. So, let's talk about some horror movies that are set in New York, um, just briefly. And we've covered some of these already. Some of these we haven't, but there's some quite famous ones like King Kong, uh, and all of all of its remakes. Um, you know, obviously ending on the Empire State Building. You don't get much more famous shot than that, really, of, of King Kong himself. Even movies like Rosemary's Baby. Um, you've got Sisters, Driller Killer, which Gav mentioned. Uh, you Cruising, which you watched recently with Sarah. I did, and that was an experience. Yeah, uh, the Ghostbusters one and two. Um, you I, know, I think I almost said Sarah. I said, I wonder if I should pick this for my uh, <laughs> birthday episode. Why? Why? American Psycho um, is obviously set there, and that is that yuppie culture we were talking about. Uh, Wolfen, you know that that kind of comes I like into the, Wolfen. Yeah, and that falls into the category of like basket case child of a really we, gritty. We covered it, didn't we? Did we cover? Oh, it? Maybe, I don't think we did. No, we didn't. We should do though. Tom, yeah, Tom I wouldn't mind covering that. It. Yeah, mm. um, even the first Howling movie, the majority of that is set in New York as well. Um, there are so many movies that are set there the sentinel um J jason takes manhattan although it's only the last five minutes of that where he shows up in manhattan <laughs> it was filmed in like canada or somewhere i think it was in Van <laughs> vancouver i think you're right uh cloverfield godzilla you know the, the one that we like the the 90s godzilla um so there's a ton is, of has there ever been a godzilla no but there should be right a fish movie yeah yeah there should be Hmm. Um, so there was a lot of horror movies set in New York. Uh, there's a lot of movies, obviously, but horror movies specifically. But let's move slightly adjacent to that and talk about this era or era of horror. So the very early 80s, where, like I said to you, the FX guys were the rock stars. Now, I've already talked about The Thing, you know, from 1982. Um, but it was there was just this thing happening in, in horror in the very early the, 80s. The, the thing, Rob Bolt, Rick, uh, Rob, Rob Bolt, he, uh, uh, is a, a effects is a little bit higher than these. No, oh, yes, of course. Okay. But, <laughs> just but I'm just talk, I'm just talking about creature feature effects, okay. horror movies like The Blob. Yep, you know, the remake Blob of the Blob was Gremlin. <clears throat> Gremlins. Of the, Blob. the Gremlins came out around this time as well, you know, and that was really pushing, you know, the effects boundaries. You know, the stuff which we've covered as well. Yeah. Even Critters, in the early to mid '80s, a lot of the more successful, whether on VHS or whether at the cinema, a lot of the more successful horror movies were creature films like The Fly, anything with special effects in it, Predator pumpkin head yeah uh, there's a ton of them really and it's a i would highly recommend and probably say that anything from 1980 to 85 the effects are going to be practical and they're going to be some pushing boundaries they're competing with each other so they're going to probably show you something you've not seen before or try and do something doesn't always work but try and do something you've never quite seen before my last thing i'm going to say before we uh, go into our trailer is and although Wolfen you know uh, and parts of the Howling were set in New York because New York is like this urban jungle this concrete jungle 
you've never had a proper werewolf movie set there. How good would a werewolf movie be in New York? You know, Central Park, running around all the buildings at night. Yeah, because wolfing kind of allures to that in a way. Hmm. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. What about an English werewolf in New York? What about if someone was to remake that? It, or not remake it, but like do a, a late sequel? And, uh... <laughs> what about Sting's I'm an alien in New York if Sting could be a werewolf yes in New York that would be a bit shit I'm though, a werewolf he's a bit shit oh, though Sting I'm a werewolf in sadly, New York one of the only sadly one of the only vampire films really that happens in New York is uh, one that I know that you're not a fan of and that's Eddie Murphy's Vampire in Brooklyn um, I'm not gonna say like I'm not a fan like specifically like walking down the street of a fucking board saying I'm not a fan of Vampire <laughs> Brooklyn. Like um, I don't know, I'm not gonna jump out saying that I'm a fan either. I don't remember it, but I don't remember it being good. I only watched it once. It, it's not that great. Got, um, it was one of those times back in the day when before before boys and girls before the internet and all that shit when you have oh, I've got a girlfriend I could go well, what should we do just go get a movie out here. So we'll get a sp- it's something to do wander to the video shop spend some time bring it back put it on hopefully it's not shit vampire in Brooklyn just don't remember it's not it's not that good but there we go guys so that is a taste of what new york is all about at this time and also um the sort of horror movies that were out and about so large apples the big old the big old apple the city so nice they named it twice so yeah bear all of that in mind when we talk about um basket case and chud because uh, they both sort of allude to especially chud some urban legends and stuff so but before we go to Chud, we're, we're going to talk about Basket Case and not the song by Green Day, which is a great song, by the way. Um, you know the song that you go. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you have the time to listen to me? Great song. Uh, yeah, we both did that because then we start singing. So. No, like, like on the last episode um, where we sing? can we sang thanks to Rachel for that. We ended up singing Postman Pat and his Black and White Cat <laughs> about five times. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, thank you for your feedback, Rach. I'm glad you enjoyed that episode, by the way. Yes. Um, all right. Well, that's New York. That's horror New movies week. in the early 80s. Uh, should we take a little break and uh, have a trailer for the old uh, basket case? Okay, yeah. Here's the trailer. What is the secret Dwayne is hiding in the basket? What's in the basket? Easter eggs? What's in the basket? Clothes. What's in the basket? Nothing. What's in the basket? My brother. What's in the basket? Open it, if you dare. Basket case. Okay, so our first film of the episode is Basket Case from 1982. It's only an hour and 30 minutes. Wasn't rated at the time it came out. Here's the synopsis. A young man carrying a big basket that contains his extremely deformed, formerly conjoined twin brother seeks vengeance on the doctors who separated them against their will. Directed by Frank Hennenlotter, who I think also did Frank and Hooker and a couple of other movies with a similar style. That's another uh, eight, um, 80s New York movie. So with this one... This, with this movie, this was one of those ones, like I mentioned earlier, where I would walk into the video store and I'd see Basket Case, and you'd see the eyes peeking out of the basket on the front, and you'd think, what is this about? And I, you read the back, you know, and that synopsis I've just read out. You want to see it as a kid. You want to see this deformed creature living in a basket, you know? I didn't. <laughs> you didn't want to see it. No. Don't, don't show me him. I don't um, I'd, I'd go into the video shop and, like, like, in a way, 
you did have a lot of horror titles when the boom of VHS came out. At the same time, you didn't have a huge range, if that makes sense as well. And um, I don't know, the the mutant type subgenre, I've never been a fan of really. I don't want to see like growths. Yeah, I mean you're you're not baskets. fully in. Yeah, you're not. I don't like body horror. Yeah, I was going to say, and and I think the same with Chud. Really, Chud's front cover, American Werewolf in London. You know, there's a lot of horror movie covers that stood out when you're looking around the shelves. I used to read the back of this box all the time, and I didn't probably see it until probably when I was in my fifteen or sixteen. I did watch this a few times though when I was younger. Did you? Yeah. Oh man. <clears throat> well. Um, what I would say is it's a very, 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 very low budget film. Um, they do very well with with what they've got. Um, there the, are some. There's one scene though. Later on, we get to. And I'll, I'll say about it now. He goes to visit a vet with his basket, and he turns up, and he's like, "Hello, I'm here with my cat." And she's like, "Okay, come in." Okay. He goes into the room for her, and then she's like, "He's like." Actually, it's not my cat that I've brought here for you to see. Oh, what is it? At that point, I expected him to get his cock out and it to be wow. porn. It was like, this has to be porn. The, the act was so wooden. It was like, this. Ha- it is almost out of boogie noise. It was like, what the fuck? It was funny, it was funny as fuck in a very sweet way. They, well, they were working with barely a budget. Um, uh, apparently, the amount of money he's got, he carrying around with him, in his hotel room in the in the scenes that was that the actual budget for the film amazing uh, probably about you so know less filmed, than ten thousand so dollars so they had to film those shots first then otherwise yeah. they wouldn't have had the money later and then, on. then go out and spend the money on everything it's so funny um and it does feel like this could this is like a more sinister version of um a trauma film do you know what i mean there's and it does deal with some not tough subject matter because it's quite unbelievable at times but also we have heard of stories of conjoined twins and people who've got their twin inside them and re- we've recently had um that movie um malignant um with conjoined twins and stuff so that's kind of something that fascinated always fascinated me anyway really it's a very unusual uh, uh subgenre you also, you of course have twins now not they're not conjoined I do. They they're separate. not conjoined no they're not and they're not part of me uh, well, sometimes they are, i they're suppose not. It, sometimes you're probably like i wish you both were conjoined because then it, like, you wouldn't be like i wouldn't have to look over there then one of you runs over there you'd be in the same spot the whole time yeah when one of them runs in one direction and the other that does the other that's fine um some of this film can be quite harrowing especially with the stuff when when he's younger and he's having the operation um and there's a lot of screaming and stuff like my wife kept popping her head back in the room going what what? he's been screaming for ages i i uh, i watched earlier and i've got the dog with me like i said earlier old beansy and um at at one point a lady starts screaming and i had to turn it down about five decibels on the old uh, controller because the dog was not liking it and i was like fuck me that is loud and long but it's a great it's a great idea and the idea came about because the the writer thought of the the phrase basket case and thought well what would that be like as a horror film if someone had a basket with something in it and then he came up with a whole conjoined I, twin thing I, yeah i assumed it came out i was thinking about it as we watched it like oh they came up with it first because basket case was like a sort of a, a saying as such wasn't it a yeah way saying it. yeah now I do think that this film has a great a great plot, and you're probably not going to think that. But I, the acting obviously doesn't always stand up very well. But I do think it's a great story in that it's 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 a revenge film about a, a guy. And we're going to spoil this off, obviously off the bat, but we'll get into the story properly in a minute. But it's a revenge film about a guy who used to have a conjoined twin. He was forced to have that twin removed from him. The twin didn't die. He keeps it in a basket and they go around hunting down the doctors that did this to them. It's quite dark. It sounds really like a Cronenberg dark. movie. Maybe it does, Cronenberg yeah. should uh, uh, like remake it. If Cronenberg and... God, um, I'm not watching that and Sarah would uh, be all over it. And what's the... Is it Lloyd Kaufman from Trauma? Yeah. If, if him and Cronenberg s- sat together, got got drunk in the early 80s, this would be what they came up with. Oh my God, what sort of <laughs> love child of a film would that be? There'd be a lot of New York cocaine in it as well, um, which I should imagine there was in 
in this behind the scenes on this. That's probably where a lot of that budget went. In fact, some of those notes were rolled up, so that wouldn't be surprise me. No. Um, okay, well let's let's get into it. Um, so we start off with um, Dwayne, our hero, if you will, played by Kevin Van Hettenreich. He has got Brian May hair. His hair is pretty big, isn't it, Gav? Huge, giant. God damn this movie like at times I was just like trying to like just watch the film and it just it doesn't matter what was on the screen any dialogue it could be the fucking the the most magical words you only hear and you could die like then and be happy with eternal happiness these certain words and I wouldn't be able to hear them because I was looking at his fucking hair yeah. it's fucking massive it is a big hair it's fucking huge it's so big and at times the camera's like down looking upwards like why are you choosing this angle like what are we doing here is it like is it like a bird with plumage like i'm gonna attract you with this it's not a good afro it's not like a a a good good afro it's a bad afro it's not even so well it's a white man it's it's a a brian may afro yeah it's a brian May. brian may's afro it's brian may's hair yeah. Um, well, we start off with Dwayne, um, and he's... He's oh, called Dwayne as well. Sorry, we don't start with him. We actually start off with a little bit of a a, a bit with a guy in the, bu- in the bushes outside his house. You is, can he, hear. is he called Dwayne, then? Dwayne Bradley, yeah. He's not doing well in life, is he? He's got had a horrible star. Yeah. Right, let's call him he's Dwayne. Got, he's got a nice auntie, though, that we'll talk about when we get to her. Um, okay, so we start off with a guy who was a doctor... Uh, and he's leaving his house. He can hear something in the bushes creeping about. There's some really good camera work here. I kind of, uh, I kind of didn't mind this. It's kind of remind, made me think of like a real late night as a kid turn over the telly. There's a horror movie on. You don't want it. You just turn it on to it. It's things like that. Yeah, and this doctor is chased back into his house by these noises. He hears something climbing around on the roof. He hears breathing. And he tries to call the cops, but his phone's been cut. And then... Uh, we just see this horrible, gnarly, mutant hand pop up from the bottom of the screen. Grab and he him. says, no, no, no. <laughs> and then it claws his face off pretty much. And that's the start. And then we head over to New York City. Yeah. Um, and this is where we meet Dwayne. So Dwayne, not only does he have giant hair, he's trying to be inconspicuous. Dwayne. He also has a giant fucking basket that he carries everywhere he goes with him everywhere you know if you're looking for this guy if the cops are like oh, i think it was a what did the guy look like giant hair giant basket right we'll find him in minutes easy easy to spot brian may just take brian a guitar may. out of his hands and put a basket into it just think of brian may get doing his laundry arts, get your sketch artist to do brian may holding a basket basket of laundry and it's just like hold it like a guitar pose but a basket <laughs> Well, he's walking through the streets um, of New York and, you know, some guys, hey, buddy, what do you want? Uppers, downers, coke, weed, I got it all. And he's trying to sell it. And, you know, we see prostitutes or sex workers. We see drug dealers. We see pimps. We see every every type of life as he's walking through New York. And he comes across a hotel. Cla- classic, Ho- classic guy at the desk. Yeah, oh. Classic kind of greasy guy. He looks like... Um, if Bob Hoskins let himself go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's that's not good, is it? You know, he's like a chubby white vest with braces over the top of it. Bob, Bob Hoskins wasn't sort of George Clooney in it up on it every day, was he? <laughs> Rest in peace. But, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, but this guy is just like, he's running the hotel. When Dwayne asks for a room, he's like, well, how long do you want it for? Do you want it for an hour? Do you want it for a day? Do you want it for a year? Basically, this this hotel really is mainly for people to come and pay sex workers for an hour or two of their time. I lived at a hotel for two weeks. You did when you fucked your, uh, that, your back up. Oh, I wonder what you were going to say. That's going to say, no, that's another trip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you carry on. on. doesn't matter. Carry uh, on. I don't think I know about this other trip, Gav. Uh, carry on okay so yes he goes to the hotel he gets a room and the, the guy's like oh i need money up front 
He's like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Here's the money. He seems to have a lot of money, and all the drunks that hang around on the reception desk are like, that guy's loaded. <laughs> the, the, the dude's like either uh, a bit weird, which I think they're probably thinking he's a bit, uh, how they might look at him as a bit simple. They might look at him a bit le- less intelligent. Um, uh, the fact he's just wandering around his basket for a start. But, yeah, just pulling out a lot of money, you, just, you don't do it. You don't do it now. And right. they say to him, "What's what's in the basket?" And he's like, "Oh, just some of my um, personal possessions." I'm like, okay, so he goes up to his room, and I, on- I would be like, "Serial killer, there's definitely a head in that." <laughs> Gwyneth or Paltrow's also- head is in that. As he heads up to the room, he walks past um, a sex worker or a prostitute or a hooker, if you want to be in the New York eighties, called Casey, and she, she sort of she takes a shine to him. She does. She she is ushering a punter into a room as she does it, but she also looks at him and sort of says, "Hey, honey, welcome to the hotel." Yeah, at the same time, she's just been neighbouring. Like, she's probably just yeah. like trying to just live her life. She just happens to like bang for her job. As like you know, yeah. So he get he gets in, gets into his room, and he puts the basket down on the chest of drawers, and he whispers to it, "We're here." And you think, oh, hang on a minute, he's talking to the basket, what's going on? Yeah, so uh, I went into this again, I've, I've seen it before, but I went into this again without kind of knowing anything. And I, it was only like later on, I was like, oh, it's a revenge film. Later mm. on, when there's a doctor killing going on. Um, so for me, so I was sort of trying to imagine it as if you just went to the cinema back in the day, like you would when this came out, this would have been straight for the New York cinema. Uh, that the people in there. Um, Imagine seeing that in a New York cinema in 1982. Grimy. Um, and uh, uh, and but yeah, with the, with the audience, you don't know what is in the basket. Uh, you're yet to find out as much as I am. So I was like, okay, I, I'm going to play it like that. I know what it that's is, good. But I, I was playing like that, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so he goes out, buys some junk food, some burgers, and some fries, and comes back unlocks the basket and starts throwing food in and you hear like rah, 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 disgusting eating well, he, noises he's chatting away to it as well throwing in cheeseburgers yeah he says um wow well, we need to find this doctor in the phone book could so be let me Mogwai. just could be could be anything and he says oh damn it the person we're looking for in this phone book isn't in the book we'll have to go to one of their ex-colleagues and see if they've got the address. So he's setting something up. We know that him and whatever's in this basket are looking for a doctor at this point. How, how's the thing <clears> in the <throat> basket, whatever he's feeding, because I'm pretending I don't know, how does it shit? Well, I should imagine it's got a... Well, it's got a penis, because it oh. fucks someone. Well, it fucks that girl, doesn't it, it's, later on? <clears> I, did, I don't remember this, and I mean, that, that was a bit shocking earlier. And also, oh. basket case two is... Or is it three? Three, he finds out that his brother has got a kid. So it's made a baby in the basket case three. Oh, dude. So, so if it's got a willy, it's got a bum gab, which means it can do a poo. Does he have to wipe his brother's bum or does it do it himself? Hey, this, isn't it? He spends a lot of time sat in the toilet as well, Bilal, doesn't he? This is um, a greasy strangler territory. By the way, uh, the creature, his brother, is called Bilal. So we will at times refer to him by his real name. Yeah. So... So in the middle of the night, um, he, he wakes up. And it's a very good, cheap way of doing this because we, they don't have to provide a voice for the creature for the most part because it can talk to him telepathically. And he wakes up in the middle of the night, Dwayne, and he's like, no, look, I'm trying to sleep. Please, just let me sleep. Not now. We'll deal with it all in the morning. And he's just talking to himself. But he's actually linked telepathically to his brother. So, um, yeah, that will come into play a bit later on. So the drunk guy from downstairs is curious about what's in Dwayne's room and he starts like loitering outside and and the prostitute, Casey, who you said has taken a shine to him. Sex worker. She says, stop, leave him alone. He's just a young lad with a basket. Don't worry about it. Let him get on with his own business. We've all got our own weird business in this hotel. So Dwayne says, I'm going to go and visit uh, my doctor friend now. And I'll take my basket with me. And this is Dr. Needleman. This who was... remind... Go on. I was going to say, he reminds me a bit of Peter Jackson's doctor in um, Brain Dead. Mm. Uh, not Peter Jackson, but that doc, you know, the doctor in Brain Dead that injects, you know, he's got a Nazi symbol on his arm and that. It's very gross. Horrible. What that, were you going to say? The receptionist takes uh, takes a fancy to him. Well, God, she's attracted to his hair. Have you seen his massive hair? I, she she has red flags all over it though later on when she fucking stalks him she says 
within it's minutes like of him being there. Red flag. Within minutes of him being there, she says, "Have you? So you're new to New York?" And he's like, "Yeah." He could She's be like, there for an STD. She says, "Have you been to the World Trade Tower?" No. What? I guess actually what? she'd know what he's got. Have you been to the Statue of Liberty? No. What? And she's really cross that he's not been to any of these places. And then she says, well, <laughs> maybe I could be your New York City tour guide. <laughs> yeah, she's well into it. And he's sort of like... Should she mm, be checking, maybe. trying to chat up? Like, patience? Probably not. I think, I think she's pretty desperate. Um, but uh, he says, tell the doctor I need to have my chest examined. So she says, all right, I'll do that. And we cut to Dwayne leaving. So we don't see what happens in that doctor's surgery, but Dwayne leaves. And she, this is where she says to him, what I'm trying to say here is, do you want to go on a date with me? And he's like, no, no, I can't, I can't. And then he goes and puts the basket down at the other end of the room, comes back over to her and whispers, yes, I actually would like to go on a date with you. And this is so Bilal, his she, brother, doesn't she, hear. Yeah, she's like, why are we whispering? So he doesn't hear. Who? The doctor? I know. It's funny. <laughs> um, so he's now been in New York for 12 hours. He's already got a date and he's already lined up his first sort of kill. And what does he do to celebrate? He goes to watch a kung fu movie in a theatre. Yeah. Uh, so we cut to a really badly dubbed kung fu film. Um, and he's watching it with uh, with his basket next to him. By the way, uh, when he's in a doctor's, we did see him without a shirt on. He had a massive uh, scar on his side. That's right. And the doctor says, well, we come back to the doctor in a minute. Um, so while he's in the cinema, what looks like a bit of a sex pervert is watching him. And you think, is he going to come over and try and molest him or something? He's just waiting for any opportunity. He's an opportunist. As soon as he falls asleep, because Dwayne's very tired, this guy steals the basket. Yeah, well, he wakes runs, up, looks next to him, and the basket's gone. And he runs he runs off to the men's toilet with it and kicks it open. Drops it on, on the floor, kicks the, uh, the, uh, uh, the padlock that breaking off of it, opens it up, but we see from the camera looking outwards, and we still don't see what it is. No, but we do see the look of horror on this thief's face. Um, and we hear lots and lots of screaming. Um and his face gets completely slashed Dwayne runs in and he says no no not yet save it save it for when you really need to do it yeah um and there's blood everywhere uh and he just runs off with the basket and then we cut to Dr Cutter what a name Dr Cutter that's her name Dr Judith Cutter and she's having dinner with a guy in her apartment and she is offering it to him on a plate here. Be better if her name was Doctor. Doctor, Doctor Cutter. Doctor, Doctor. Okay. What, well, Doctor, Doctor? I think I. There's a joke here. Are you going to tell me a joke? No, not really. Okay. Right. Um, so yes, Doctor Cutter is having dinner with this man, and he says, "Oh, I'm going to get drunk if I keep drinking." And she's like, "Well, that's my plan." Ha 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 ha. And she gets a phone call. And the phone call is from Dr. Needleman. And he says, a man has just been into my office. A man that matches the description of that boy uh, that we removed something from. We did that operation on him and he had a big scar all down him. And he wants to know, you know, um, about what the other doctors that were involved. And he told me that Dr. Liflander is dead. And this is the guy from the opening scene. And she says, well... We thought he might come back around at some point. She doesn't seem bothered by this, the fact that this kid is now hunting her down. She goes back to her dinner date and probably ends up bonking that man that's in her apartment. She's got one trap mind. Yep. Sexy. Sexy. Sexy one trap mind, Dr. Cutter. Um, cut back to Sharon, the receptionist. She leaves the doctors. Uh, and Dwayne empties the basket and he says, uh, right, the coast is clear. Whatever is in there empties out onto the floor. And he says to his brother, go in there and get the address book. Be as quick as you can. I'll be waiting in the alleyway downstairs. So he's waiting outside. And um, Bilal is in the office. And um, the doctor, Dr. Needleman, hears a noise. And he goes out and the door is off its hinges. And he thinks... 
okay, something bad's going to happen here. I need to barricade myself in my office with all my desks. Yep. <clears throat> the lights are all out. He hears a noise, goes into another room, turns the light on, and what does he see, Gav? So for the first time, he sees our, uh, our, our broski. Uh, Bilal. Bilal. Looks like Harvey Weinstein's hemorrhoid. Fucking hell. That is terrifying. Um, I've got to say, and I remember seeing this for the first time, that it, it was quite a terrifying first shot of him because he's he doesn't really talk he just sort of screams yeah i know it's quite disturbing actually i found it when i was when he was on the screen it was on the screen it's quite disturbing it's like I a testicle like with arms and a face i don't like it uh but somehow he's on the wall i guess he's really strong and he's on the wall and he kills uh, this he doctor like, little suckers like, a fucking like octopus. an octopus Ugh. But well, he does call him later on. He says, my brother looks like a deformed octopus. Ha, ha, ha. The blood's kind of like the hammer horror blood. Yeah, he rips his guts out it's of his stomach, weird. doesn't he? Yeah. Um, and he can, and he's, you know, he's, he's dying. It also badly. kind of looks like that dude uh, uh, who thinks he's the head shit at Jabla Hutt's palace at the front. Got that big, oh, big yeah. thing coming out of his head. It looks like his love child or something. Yeah, uh, Bib Fortuna, the one who's got the big squid things coming out of his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah he does. Like him. Yeah. I mean, he is, he is pretty hot shit, Gav. He's Jabba's like right hand man. He's his translator. You know, he sort of brings yeah, people I think in. He to thinks, see him. I think he thinks he's bigger than he is. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But but Luke takes him down to peg, doesn't he? So oh, fuck him, fuck Bib Fortuna. So yes, yeah, so um, Dwayne's waiting outside in the. Uh, the alleyway and we hear well we see the shadow of Bilal and Bilal's come out the window and he's got the address book and he pops him back in the basket and he says excellent this is great everything's going to plan we cut to the morning and uh, Dwayne's feeding some raw sausages into the basket now oh, oh. is that like <laughs> is that like a new saying I'm gonna feed my raw sausage into the basket feeding my sausages into the basket but but Talking of such things, Dwayne also, although he's on a mission with his brother to kill these doctors, he's also on a mission Would to, like me to get his end away. Feed my sausage into your basket. Because he is so excited about this date he's got. Said the bishop. With, with um, the, the lady, the receptionist. Um, so he's bought a fucking TV, a cheap knockoff TV, and he says to Bilal... Oh, I've got to go out and case the place. Yeah, here's um, cable for TV tonight. for you. Here's some TV. Oh, and there's some newspapers there as well if you get bored. See you later. And he just runs off. You might just have a bit of fly on the wall. This fucking thing sitting there looking at the paper while TV's on the background. <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? What's going on on Wall Street today? Bloody hell, the stocks are up, aren't they? Oh, what the fuck? What does he care what's going on? In the but he world? rips... Well, he does rip the knob off the TV because he knows, because he can telepathically link. No, it's quite knows. comical. He don't, he not, I think he pulls it off. I think he just goes, ah, oh, fucking load of shit. That's the kind of way his hand is. His hand acts in the way of, like, this is shit, not, like, aggression. Yeah. Uh, well, he goes out on the date, um, and he's really, you know, that's where he really is. He's not casing Dr. Cutter's apartment. And he's out on the date, and he really, really likes this girl, and she really likes him, too. I struggled the fuck with this part of the movie. Though. I was just like, oh, my God, because the camera doesn't move. It just sits there, and they talk. I would say this is oh one, of the, God. one of the worst on-screen on screen kisses I've ever seen. Just the whole thing's kill me now. Please kill me. When they kiss, it's like they're trying to eat each other's faces. And I guess they're both quite nerdy, and they may maybe not have kissed many people, but my God, it's it's really bad. And when he kisses this girl, obviously he gets a bit excited, but because he's telepathically linked to his brother, Bilal, who's still in the hotel room... This would make a great X-Files episode. Well, there was one like this. There was a bit, yeah. Yeah, but they go to that um, freak show, and there's a guy whose little thing comes off of his body in the night and, and goes off is, killing people and oh yeah yeah that's true and there's like a telepathic one as well so yeah and there's also um total recall you oh, know with the yeah uh, so that this is but i was been just done. thinking like an x-files episode it would make quite a good one yeah um uh, i love the fact the basket case is just uh, basically he is now acting like a teenager in 2023 when the internet has gone down for more than 10 minutes a teenager made of stop motion animation <laughs> yeah angry now getting rowdy i commend them for trying 
stop motion animation sadly never really holds up that well and it does look weird when it jumps out of the basket and starts i feel like i'm watching an episode of morph i don't know but yeah but morphing like i've just taken bad acid yeah it, well, it made me almost feel but not sick but it's just like uh, I don't know body horror and I know it's not even real and it's fucking clay mo stop motion but it's something about it maybe just be like oh uh, I don't like this well Bill out screams so loud and he smashes the room so much the TV and everything that every single person in the hotel this isn't this is every person in this, this complex and this isn't the first time this will happen but this happens about four times yeah. throughout the film so Every they, member of the hotel they, gathers. They have got nothing else going on. They're literally like so got nothing going on. They could just stop whatever they're doing at any moment and just go wander around and stand outside someone's room wondering what's happening. So come on. So um, old sweaty Bob Hoskins look alike. He says, right, what the fuck's going on? I- I've got the key. Obviously, this is my hotel. Let me go in the room. And they go in the room. And there's no sign of anybody it's in like there. A mystery. Like, where is it? Well, there's no one in here. And they're all sort of like, well, we all heard screaming and noise. And he says, right, everybody, back out of the room. Come on, it's time to go. One dude notices a load of money in the bed. Oh, yeah. that's not The good. drunken guy. He's like, oh, there's some money in there. Uh, so he goes back and he picks the lock with the intention of stealing this big wad of cash. Yeah, now uh, there's a point here um, where... Um, he goes over to the, he gets the money then he goes over to the basket he's looking for more stuff and he opens a basket and old broski mutant mutant testicle of Harvey Weinstein broski is there in, in the basket but they could have done it and he wasn't there it would been like a lot more tension open it up and it wasn't there turns around it then jumps at him you know it's fairly easy it would have been a bit better but you know he opens it up and he gets it in the face. It's in the face. Hmm. It's quite a good effect. It looks like he's been slashed four times down the face by claws. Those bits are pretty good. That happens um, uh, a couple of times in the film. And Dwayne feels that he's killed someone from where he is, because, again, they're, they're linked. Um, so the others come back in the room because they've heard more screaming. So, again, the entire hotel and, and empties so, into the room. So, so at this point here, it is... I, I kind of give a bit of kudos, actually, because at the moment it wasn't really... I suppose it was kind of a structure. If I broke it down, I really looked at it. But here there really was a kind of midpoint term where the basket case goes out the window. And at this point, I was like, does he now go out on the streets of in the city and start causing chaos? That's what I was hoping. And doesn't really happen. He kind of he's at home again. I'm a bit confused. You need to help me with what's going on. In a in a parallel universe, I'd love that to have happened. That's what him, I wanted to happen. And that's imagine him. Turn. He um, then goes out into the New York. Imagine him mugging a skateboarder, and then he's wheeling around on a skateboard oh, using his arms. That, he he could have <laughs> hanged out of Quang from the Turtles. He is a bit like Quang from the Turtles, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, God. Imagine those two being buddies together. Yeah, well, he just screams at all the time, so nothing get happen, and nothing get done with it. Yeah. Well, um, Dwayne gets back, um, and the police are there, and they're like, where have you been? And he's like, oh, I, I've been on a date. Um, the, the, the detective here is the best actor in this whole film. He's amazing, isn't he? He's great. <laughs> he, he, really stand, stands he isn't that great, but it stands out because no one else is that is, is at that level. He just comes across as a genuine cop. Yeah, he, he's just acting. He's just doing the thing without it really st- stalled. I'm saying lines, you know. He says to him, um, okay, so you were on a date and you didn't hear anything. You don't know anything about this. Okay, interesting. And why have you got so much cash in your hotel room? Yeah. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, look, I'm going to probably come back to you for further questioning. Would that be all right? And Dwayne's like, yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely fine. He plays it very cool, Dwayne. Uh, it might not be the first time he's had to cover the tracks of his crazy little brother. Um, so they leave, and Dwayne looks around thinking, well, where the hell is my brother? Well, he's in the toilet, Gal. Of course he's in the toilet. Oh, That's a little really... hand pops up in the back. Hello. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, what are you guess, doing imagine, there? Imagine that, though, in the middle of the night, and he, go, he goes to the toilet. Oh. And you sit down. Oh, sorry, I forgot you were in there, Bilal. Whoa, what was that? Well, I'm just caressing your balls. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, I don't want mutant, mutant hand caress, ball caress. Well, they have a telepathic argument. That's one of my songs from the album. T- mutant ball caress. Mutant ball hand, uh, mutant hand ball caress. Wow. By Rat Orgy. Yeah. So they have a telepathic argument about the date and... Um, 
you know, basically, but we get the impression that Bilal won't allow him to live his own life. Yeah, that, well, the- yeah. Well, we we figured that because that was a very great at best uh, a representation of that. As when he went and put the basket down and came back to receptionist and whispered that I'm going to date straight away. It's like, oh, he's hiding it from him because of. Yeah, something like that. Well, there's this, almost a similar relationship to Norman Bates and his mother, and I use mother in quotation marks, in that he's not allowed to ever yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. have a normal life or fall yeah. in love because he's got this commitment to this family I think, member. I think that, that story motif uh, probably happens best in the way you just described it between the mother and the child, you yeah. know, the parent and the child. Not the deformed octopus brother. <laughs> no, no, not the dude, it is fucking hemorrhoid mutant brother. <sighs> Um, so he says to him at the end, look, Bilal, don't worry, I'll never desert you, I promise. And they sort of, they're, they're buddies again-ish. And then we cut to a nightclub scene. A dirty, seedy-looking nightclub bar, isn't it, Gav? Everyone's doing everything I imagine there. they just walked into the nearest bar. Can we film it? Yeah, no oh, worries. That, uh, oh, Gav, they did. All of this was, 90% of this film was shot guerrilla style. Yeah, I said, e- Even is, the naked all, scenes. I know, all of the decor was original decor, yeah. The, the naked scene, which comes up later... Um, where he runs down the street naked. To do that, they basically got him in a in a, a van with loads of blankets over him, and they had another van parked at the end of the block. And someone would go out with a brush, brush the sidewalk down all the way to the other end, make sure there was no glass or anything for him to stand on. This was like three in the morning, and then they'd go action. And he'd run from one van into the other van. And they did that about four times and then <laughs> edited it together. So if you'd have seen it, you'd have seen this giant Brian May-haired man running with his dick flapping around. Uh, that's funny enough, his bush looks like Brian May's hair again. Yeah, he's got it up, up and down, hasn't he? Yeah. The collars match the cuffs. I, I didn't notice it, yeah. Collars and cuffs. Um... Where were we? Oh, yeah, so we're in the CD nightclub, and while he's in there, who does he see? He's, he's Casey, the sex worker. And she says, hey, hey, you're the guy with the basket from the hotel. Listen, I'm getting absolutely fucked off my nut over here. Do you want to come and <laughs> come come f- join me? me? I've never seen people laugh so much drunk loudly in each other's faces because they're acting over the the acting is just okay you got act drunk laugh lots okay no laugh more you're drunk okay ha 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 i kind of like this scene though oh what the fuck why do you like it what i like about this scene is he drunkenly reveals the whole plot to her because they're so drunk (laughs) i I do like that i give you that it's silly say again yeah, she thinks he's just been silly. Yeah. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa. I think At first, until there, she it? goes, you're, you're creeping me out now. Yeah, because she says to him, um, look, I, one thing I want to know about you is what's in the basket. And he says, my brother. And she laughs and laughs. And she says, what yeah, is he, but a midget? It keeps, go- it keeps going. She's like, and after a while, she stops laughing. And well, that's she says, what says, you're creeping me out eventually. What is he, a midget? And he says, no, we're twins. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, he's deformed. Our mother died giving birth to us. Ha, ha, ha. We were attached to the hip. Ha, ha, ha. Now he talks to me in my head. And she's like, that's when she says, well, you're creeping me out a little bit. Because she can tell maybe he's been a bit serious here. And then we get flashbacks. We enter quite a major flashback now. It's a flashback. It turns into another fucking movie. It's like scenes. It's not just a flashback with us like like one shot. It's scenes. I was like, all right, okay, all right. So we cut to the day that Dwayne was born. And obviously, his mother died having birth, giving birth to him and this his is, this one is brother. It gets a little bit more serious when you're looking at it earlier. You sort of said about it. it's this part here because it it does come down to an actual question. It's kind of it comes down to the question of abortion, basically. Yeah, it's really That's dark, what, isn't uh, it? It's essentially sort of saying, and they, and then going, um, no, you cut it off because at least that gives him a chance to live, like the the more of the human person. Um, um, so just to, what about the other thing? I'll oh, get rid of it. Sort of, you know. Well, they're saying. You know what what he says it i'm not calling it anything it's not my son only one of these things is my son the other one is just a thing just a growth yeah. um so they don't do anything about it for 12 years and it says 12 years later <clears throat> excuse me and their auntie is looking after them you can you gotta look at this from a parent perspective though if they've done 12 years they've been trying mm. and it must be to a point where, like you've like we need to give him a chance because you would you would essentially want to do that 
but his dad has caved. His dad lost his wife, you know, at the, yeah. for the birth of this this son and thing attached to it. So he gets to backstreet, back alley doctors round to his house, who we find out later on one of them is a vet later on. It's a bit gnarly though. It's just like holding him down. It's kind of like going into your sort of seventies, kind of like uh, a Satan worshiping type sort of film or something. It's real like, like they take it. They take the doctor up to the room, and he turned the little boy turns around. He's twelve years old, and he's got Bilal, little baby Bilal, hanging off of his side, and it's disturbing to see, man. Yeah. It's disturbing to see, and it's the subject matter as well, really. He, they overhear everything that's been talked about downstairs, so he kind of understands. I think they're going to try and separate us. You know, this is he, this is kid hasn't had it easy for twelve years with this thing growing out of his side. You and know, the head starts making sounds like uh, of uh, same sort of sounds of the head in uh, Reanimator. Yeah, like, it's the same sort of sound. Yeah, it's like oh, this is all like. So I they, I'm they, like going, I don't like this film. They hold down this twelve-year-old boy. Uh, the doctors and they he's screaming he's screaming and so is the the head thing and they managed to knock them out with an injection come alice and- come watch the movie with me it's a good part <laughs> and then they get the cutting equipment out and then we hear all this noises of bone cutting and sawing and flesh being torn I, I you- go i'm gonna put my hands up here i pressed forwards through this bit did you only at 0.5 but it would have muted this music and sound and it just went through a little bit quicker because i was just not going uh not having a well, good time here well with this scene it tricks you because you think oh they're not going to show it though they're only we're only hearing it but then you do see them take bill out off of Dwayne with a horrible squelchy sound mm. and they say well what should we do with him and he's like i don't care what you do with it as long as my son's okay what do they do with it gav they put him in a trash bag i think the actually, I, I thought they would they would have injected the the thing the the child the mutant child um or something to put it out of misery or something or done something not just put it in the track well, and go hope, let's hope for the best I would have, yeah, but they've just think, well, it's but probably dead. But going to be like, fuck is this? Oh, it's a, a big growth. Oh, it's moving. Oh. Um, well, yeah, Dwayne wakes up uh, the morning after the operation and he, he thinks, well, where's my, my brother's not on my side. This is weird. So he, then he senses him boop, boop, in his brain. Boop, 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 boop. So he goes out and this is where he finds the trash bag and it's moving and the arm comes out of it. So he's still alive. That sounded like a kind of like a Wu Tan senses thing. Wu Tan Spider Man altogether. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, I don't know why he does this, but he creates a machine now with his brother. <laughs> they create this big. Because in the middle of the night, his dad wakes up and he hears all this sawing and drilling and he thinks, what on earth is this? So he goes downstairs. Uh, th- th- goes into, uh, some actual tension going on here. I'm gonna say when his dad starts, his fucking dick of a dad who wanders around with no fucking shoes or slippers on, or I'll go down to the basement where there's shit which could fuck my feet up and just wander around. But well, he stands idiot. on he stands on a nail, doesn't he? Yeah, he's a fucking idiot. But anyway, there's a slight bit of tension down there. That, that basement is bigger than my house times two. Oh Jesus Christ! You should see this house, my flat. You've seen this house, my flat. <laughs> It's like doors within doors within rooms. It's yeah. like a mansion down there. But anyway, he wanders around and eventually he sees lots of wood and equipment and thinks, oh, someone's been building something down here. And indeed they have. Dwayne and Bilal have put together a device which has got a big buzzsaw in the middle, loads of spikes and other cutting implements. And they've set it up like a game of mousetrap where it just flies down a big ramp straight at his dad and splits him right down the middle. Yeah, and we know this because uh, it's too short, uh, short loads of floor of legs and feet uh, d- falling apart from each other. Yeah, just like in 13 Ghosts. And um, hmm. we, the ante, then we cut to the ante saying, look, Dwayne. I'll look after you both, don't I'll, worry. I'll, I'll cover it all up, but don't worry. I'll tell them, you know, I didn't You're know anything about right. it. And we get these really disturbing slash touching scenes now. <laughs> Sitting here, and I'll tell you a story about Red Riding Hood. Yeah, she's rocking it, on the rocking chair it, with Bill Owen in but, a blanket. Yeah. But it's obviously just a, uh, a, a a thing which is not moving yet. And it's just got these dead eyes just staring forward. It's just like, oh. 
the face of Bilal is just terrifying. And then, obviously, Dwayne's sat next to her, and she's raising these boys, trying to look after them. But then, sadly, she dies because we cut to her funeral. Um, and uh, they're all alone. And then we go back to the present day. So that was the backstory of what happened to him. No wonder Jesus he Christ, so yes, it was, up. wasn't it? I forgot all about that. <clears throat> thought we were talking about another movie, yeah. So that was yeah, the flashback. It's a 20-minute flashback. Now remember what was going on before. Well, we're drunk in the bar with a sex worker. Um, and, he, yeah, so uh, she helps him get back to his hotel room. She helps him into bed. Um, she peeks inside the basket, but the basket's empty. Um, she goes back to her room. Which, gets which is that tension I'll speak about earlier, I guess. She, she gets undressed. She, she gets fully undressed. She's wearing literally just a T-shirt. And then she slides her pants off as well. She gets into bed. And as she lies back in the bed... Hashtag Me Too Basket Case. Oh, my God, it's definitely Harvey Weinstein's hemorrhoid, isn't it? Yeah, he's, he's hiding under her pillows. Uh, starts t- touching her boobs. Uh, no, 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 that's the receptionist he does that to later on. This oh, is um, Oh, yeah, he does it later too. <clears throat> but he does like touching up women when they're asleep. He's a panty stealer on this, though, isn't he? Uh, is he? Yeah, he gets the pants. Oh, I forgot about that. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, um, in her bed, the pillows move, and he's under the pillows. She wakes up and screams. She runs out of the room, and she's, again, what happens? The entire hotel runs up to the floor. (laughs) They must be getting sick of this by now. Um, And she's like, something's in my room, and it's trying to kill me. It was a thing in my room. So every single person in the hotel. And at this point, you think he's going to get, it's going to get caught. Yeah. Bob Hoskins is there again. He's like, oh, gee, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Where's Roger Rabbit? He's um, he's annoyed. Obviously, he checks the room. Uh, the window's open. Um, we see the hand go back into the basket. And Dwayne wakes up with a big hangover. Uh, before that, we do see Basket Case find the knickers. Oh, yes, that's right. Do no. uh, uh, you think he's going to have a little um, basket wank with those he, He's sniffing them, I'll tell you that. Maybe he's eating them. Who knows what he eats. Um, so in the morning, Dwayne wakes up with the worst hangover ever, and he says, right then, let's get this over with. Let's go and see Dr. Cutter. This is the fake porn scene, or actual real porn scene. The acting here, please, anybody, go watch it and be like, is this... Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's so like it. And what makes it more like a porn film is the receptionists are twins. It's so wooden. The receptionists are twins, aren't they? The two women on oh, reception. Shit, I'm looking now. So one in red and one in white. I didn't realise. Yeah, um, it's really weird. It's uh, really ca- weird. casting decision, but um, just because yeah, they're twins, it's probably <clears> like oh, because we've got a twin thing going on here. Let's put twins in it. Can they act? No, just put them in it. So, so not only right. did this happen to him when he was 12 by these doctors, but one of them wasn't, wasn't even a proper doctor. She was a vet. Um, but like you say, yes, they have some bad acting here. And he says, she's like, so what's wrong with your cat? And he says, it's actually not a cat. There's something else in my basket that you need to see. It's so bad. And she puts He puts the basket on the table and he reveals himself. And Bilal jumps out and uh, kills her. Um, well, starts to kill her. Um, she starts screaming. The receptionists are trying to get in. This is where I discovered it's a revenge film. Then this is a great moment, though, because he, she's trying to grab a scalpel because it's Bilal is strangling her, and then instead there's a drawer that she pulls open full of scalpels and sharp things, and Bilal just slams her face down into it. So when the receptionists run into the room. She's, there's a great shot where she's got all these scalpels sticking out of her face. She does scream for about screams for 20 so minutes straight. And the, and the, the, the receptionist outside is knocking saying, are you all right? No. How can you not hear the length of these screams? I think the reason they left her screaming for so long was A, it was terrifying. But B, the, if you, it, gives, it gives you a chance to look at the effects because some of those scalpels are right next to her eyeball. It looks so good. They're all just, it's like, imagine Pinhead, but with loads of scalpels. Scalpel head. Scalpel head. That's my rap name. It's not that good. 
All right, fucking hell. Rat orgy. Jack the Rapper. Jack the Rapper. Okay. So, uh, back to the hotel. And Sharon, the receptionist from earlier, she shows up. Red flag, red flag. She says, my boss has been murdered. Oh, oh. And I've I've been thinking about you all day. Why? She says, I don't know why I've been thinking about you all day, but I have. It it might be going on a date, potentially, but that is a bit full on. They've only kissed. That's all they've done. So she cries. They hug. They kiss. She is going to boil his bunny. Yeah, that's not like giving him a handjob under the table. Well, before that, they're on the bed, and he's about to put his raw sausage in her basket. Oh. But he forgets. That Bill Al is in his basket, isn't he? Ooh. Watching it all. So he starts... Imagine this. So picture yourself as Sharon, Gav. Forget all the red flags. You've gone to this man's hotel. You're getting down and dirty on the bed with him. It's all getting hot and heavy. And then all of a sudden, this hemorrhoid bursts out of a basket screaming at you. <laughs> yeah. What would you do? Because <laughs> she screams and runs out of the room. But then she tries to get back in the it, room. Yes, it depends how desperate you are for sex. She's desperate. She's like, <laughs> if you do need I let it. me in? <laughs> if, you need, if it's been a while, you know, it sometimes gets desperate, you know. Well, Dwayne and his brother fight. I, and... think, you, I think as a man, <laughs> you stop for the moment and go, right, there's just a way up the situation. I'm already at it. This is great. That is not great. This is. Can I deal with this and that? Probably. I'll just look this way. <laughs> Especially if you said to the person you have sex with, what is that in the middle? Of, and they go, don't worry about that. That's just my little deformed brother. You would. You, Why is he watching as, us? <laughs> as a man, guaranteed, you'd probably go, eh. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. Does he want I'm to join guessing, in? I'm guessing as a lady, you'd probably go, lost it now, afraid. You know, you've, you've lost me. Well, Dwayne and his brother fight, and he shoves him back in the basket. Hey, oh. um, and later on, La- the ladies, right in. Let us know if there was a deformed man. Oh my god! Twin in his basket over there. Would you carry on or would you stop? Let us know. I've got a terrible story that I could tell. Right in on the postcode, Dan. Please tell us a story. So I know someone who. Um, Oh, this is this is bad. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Every once in a while, you do one of these. Do it. Uh, so I know someone. I don't anymore, really. But um, she was with a gentleman, her ex-husband, and neither of them would ever listen to this show. So that's fine. And the, she, he used to, when they when they had sex, he used to make he used to say to her, "I need to pretend that there's a girl in the wardrobe watching us. It's the only way I can get it." get it hard and get it get it done so they had to pretend so she would have to sort of look at the wardrobe and go is she still watching us in the middle of it and he'd be like yeah yeah she's watching everything we're doing and i just thought that was so fucking weird and they're obviously divorced now that was one of the many red flags in their relationship and and if you're into that guys like if you're into voyeurism or whatever that's fine but i just find that a little bit creepy that he used to say there has to be a woman or a girl in the in the cupboard watching us. That's the only way he could get it done. How he should have done it better is put a camcorder in there, filming. And then watch in the, the cupboard. Back. No, just have that there. It might have made it better. It's a mutual understanding, I think. So that, that was my story. It didn't involve any deformed <laughs> Uncle Gav with his people, sex tips. <laughs> what you need to do, guys, life. if you want to do your own voyeurism, just follow Gav's advice. Yeah. Um. Anyway... Bilal crawls around the room, screaming at the window, and his eyes start glowing red. And he... Is that that because he's horny? I think so, but also it's like his telepathic power has reached its full potential, I think. Fucking gonna jizz everywhere, isn't he? Because he puts... He controls Dwayne now. Uh, and Dwayne dreams that he's running down the street naked. This is what I talked about earlier. And we do indeed see him running stark, bollock, naked down the streets of New York. Oh, hang on, hang on. Because cause the thing with Jiggy, so I felt like this was a representation of him, his, his brother, leaving the window again a moment ago. And I felt it was like a representation of his brother being naked and going down the streets. So I thought this was. Can we go back to it? My notes was like, yeah, he went out the window before. What happened? What did happen? Did he not go out the window? Was that a, a ruse for everyone in the, who went, ran into the room to think he had gone out the window? Yeah, he didn't go out the window. Ah, it was, <clears> so <throat> he was before hiding. that. Right, thank you. 
So uh, he's he, Dwayne is running naked through the streets, and he goes to Sharon's bedroom, um, and he starts feeling her up while boobs. she's asleep. Yes, he feels her boobs. Not something we'd it's ever recommend to someone asleep. It's a creep show two move. It is, and we all know what happens there. However, he wakes up, and Bilal is not in his room, and in fact, it's Bilal that's the one that's feeling her up. Oh, and he starts strangling her. Yep. Uh, she wakes up, yeah. and is, so you wake up to this thing on top of you, strangling you with its eyes glowing red. Yeah. Dwayne bursts into the room. Too late. She's dead. She's dead, but also it looks like he's inserted in her because when he, he pulls is. her off, he is. He's like a he's like a uh, a leech. And he's sort of going, oh, and he takes her and off. He's, there, but he's sitting on her groinal area, going up and down. It's like oh, it's oh, awful. It's like, oh, it's like. Uh, Barbara Crampton getting a head in Reanimator from a head. So, it's so bad. It's just like, oh, dude. And this was just like, I was not expecting this and I did not remember this. Yeah, man. Well, um, because they don't explicitly say it, I think it's implied, but it's definitely what's happening. Um, so we go back to the hotel again. The final time, every single one of the guests is awake. Um, and this time, Bob Hoskins says, I've had enough. I'm going to kick him out of the hotel. So he goes up to the hotel room, and um, as they walk in the room, Bilal and Dwayne are fighting, and Bilal pushes Dwayne out the window. They both fall. And then we get this kind of bittersweet moment, though, where they're hanging off of the sign, and Bilal realises this is his chance to save Dwayne, because he's hanging with one arm, and he's got Dwayne in his other arm. But because he's only a little deformed octopus fella... He hasn't quite got the strength to hold his brother and he really wants to and you can see from his face he's thinking i can't drop him he's my brother although we're fighting but sadly he hasn't got the strength and they both fall to their death in front of all of the street workers prostitutes slash sex workers splat on the ground they should have kept playing here where will i be famous bros why because brothers well the hotel was called the hotel um broslin and the way they're hanging the way they're hanging is they cut out the L and the I and the N, so it's the Hotel Bros. So it's quite good. Hanging so tough. So you're onto something there. Yeah. That was New Kids on the Block. I know. And KOTB. <laughs> if you're cool. Uh, so, yeah, they play splat on the pavement, and a man comes over, a random bloke just comes over and says, oh, yep, they're dead. And that's the end. Now, they're not dead, <laughs> because they yeah. made two how the sequels. Fuck are they not, how the fuck is their part two and part three, and can we please not watch them? Oh, that's a I, shame. Know, I know you've you've said like, and uh, later on we're going to do a part two and part three in an episode. And I was like, oh no, maybe now we maybe we'll come to them at some point. Mm. Um, before we give our thoughts and stuff on that, just quickly then, uh, Basket Case Two came out in um, nineteen ninety, so many years later, like uh, eight years later, and the the synopsis is Dwayne and his basket bound mutant brother are taken in to a secret home for wayward freaks with a journalist hot on their tail. And then Basket Case 3, which came out the following year, the synopsis is, Dwayne recovers from his delusional breakdown to find his freakish basket-bound brother will soon become a father. But not, <laughs> not everything is joyous, as the once tight-knit brothers no longer seem to trust each other. Has he got his own little life? What's he got a paper round? <laughs> he works on Wall Street. He throwing papers or someone in the basket. Um, but yeah, so basket case, nineteen eighty two. Now, my thoughts before you give yours, because I know you've got your thoughts. My thoughts are: it's a really highly original film. It feels like we've seen this so many times, but actually, this was the first time we'd seen a, a sort of conjoined twin type film. Um, the effects aren't always good, but. When you see his face for the first time, and then and a couple of times throughout this, it's quite terrifying because it's, like you said, Gav, there's no expression. It's got very soulless eyes, the way it screams. And that whole flashback, it's just really um, takes you to a really dark place, and it's quite a serious tone all of a sudden. And because of that, I've really, I've really enjoyed this. Um, and it is a silly early 80s almost trauma type film but there is a lot going on in there that pushes it slightly above for me definitely it's definitely one of those ones that people talk about it was one on the playground that people talked about and 
yeah that's that's kind of it for now for me but i really like to but tell me about you what did you think <clears throat> uh, i haven't seen it for many years and watched it again oh uh, it was um i i became a little bit bored of it my attention span didn't really stick with it anymore it's not uh it's not a gav movie I can't, you know, I can't and recommend it. Is that because it. I can't recommend body it. Or? Yeah, yeah, I can't recommend it to someone who doesn't like the movies I like or likes the movies I like doesn't like, you know, basically me, they're not going to like it. But you might be into this film. You yeah, know. if you if it does the job of making you feel a bit uncomfortable and a bit dirty and gross. It's early 80s New York grimy movie. And it's it's kind of almost a subgenre. So, like, if you know what you're getting into, you you'll yeah. probably be into it. And if you, like, you might be like, yeah, I'm really into that sort of. Thing. I l- really like the New York scene of that time. I find that uh, I find the history and you know, everything went on there quite fascinating. I've watched documentaries on the crack epidemic and all that stuff. I find it really interesting. I know it's terrible in a lot of places, but very interesting. And this is a type of film, and um, you might be into it. You know. Yeah, and, and like you said, if you know what you're getting into, I mean, the synopsis alone, if you know you're going to be watching a film about a guy with a deformed half-brother in his basket... It's not, or something. Yeah, it's not, it's not Shakespeare, but it, it does what it says, and there's some good deaths in it, and it's quite quite a good story, in my opinion. You know, you know, this kid was wronged as a 12-year-old, and so when he's older, him and his mutant brother go on the on but, the murder rampage. I, I could see it down, really emotionally done by David Cronenberg. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. If he ever did something like this... Because he did um, The Brood, didn't he? Uh, yeah. With the children growing off of the woman and going out yeah. and killing people. That's kind of his there's, version of this. There's still a rumour David Cronenberg's remaking... Uh... Basket case. Start the rumor. He's producing it, and Rob Zombie is directing it. No. Sherry Moon Sherry is Moon's going to be. In the basket. She's she's going to be in the basket. <laughs> Can you yes, imagine? I want it. I want it. Twerking. Yeah. I want oh, it. God. Uh... No, well, she, she'd go, probably play both though, wouldn't she? She'd be like him with a big, really big afro, and the basket as well. <clears throat> Do you think Rob Zombie's ultimate film would be like Men? But instead, it's like Sherry, Sherry. Moon is every character. It's just CGI called Sherry, in. and every character in it. There's a bloke. There's a kid. Somebody, please make that movie right now with AI. Sherry Moon is every character in a village, yeah. and a man. A man gets lost there. Eli Roth turns up in the village, and everyone there is Sherry Moon. Speaking of AI, I have turned to Chat GPT now. Where before I was a bit like Chat what, and I couldn't get the letters right when you tell me. Uh, I'm I'm in there now. I'm, I download it. I'm on it. It's so good. It's, it's interesting, so isn't it? amazing what you can do with it. Yeah, very very helpful tool. Well, I've got to say, Gav, it is Basket Case is a big deformed thumbs up from me. It's a big deformed raw sausage in my basket. Yes. What about you? Don't, don't know why it's to be raw. Um, dogs barking away um your, well it's because we're talking about raw sausage your thought your your opinions on body horror aside try and leave those aside what what do you think of this overall is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down uh, uh kind of it dragged for me it's a thumbs down for me okay yeah. okay well if you have seen basket case we'd be interested to know what you guys think it's one that people don't often talk about um wasn't quite a video nasty but it was probably quite close to it um but if you have seen it that's uh, sorry if you haven't seen it go check it out but be warned yeah. it's uh dirty and grimy and it you'll need a bath dirty. after it if you've seen it yeah you could watch it and follow up with greasy strangler for pudding oh god Ugh. pudding well uh, talking of drippy, talk, drippy pudding talking of drippy puddings <laughs> bill, bill, bill bill murray's here <laughs> And he has got his own raw sausage to put in our baskets because... Bill Murray and the Drippy Puddings. Is that his he's, band? He's worn a very nice tuxedo today. Mm-hmm. Um, because he's, you know, last couple of episodes, he's turned up in various gimp outfits. So he's here today with a big list, um, which he's going to pass to me so we can read out for our World of the Strange. So, Bill, if you're ready to uh, lead us into the World of the Strange, please do so, my friend. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. Hey, it's World of the New York Strange. 
Bill Murray, no stranger to New York. Okay. Um, he lives there. He loves New York. He's a New Yorker okay. through and through. And uh, obviously Ghostbusters 1 and 2, both shot in New York and, you know, set in New York. But yes, we are going to be talking about New York for, for this World of the Strange. And I have got a list of urban legends that New York is famous for. And we're going to go through these, see if you've heard of them, see what your thoughts are on them. And a couple of them I can debunk for you as well. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we talked about rats earlier. So the first one on here is the rat problem in New York. Brilliant. Apparently, there is one rat for every human in New York. Yeah. It's a lot of rats. However, apparently, that is no longer the case. They have sorted out their rat problem in the last 20 years, but there are still an awful lot of rats there. Um, I've seen that documentary, and I'm sure you have, where the guys are going around and they sort of kick some trash cans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, a, like 25 rats runs out. It's just absolutely appalling. But they do say, one of the urban legends is they do say you're never more than about two foot from a rat when you're in New York. And or, depends where you are. Me when I'm just literally here, above right there. there, no? Yeah. There you go. Well, there was that was the first one. It's not very interesting, but the second one is. The second one is you might have heard of him, Cropsy. Yes, you've all heard of Cropsy. Cropsy is a maniac who snatches children on Staten Island and kills them with his hook hand or an ice pick or an axe. Depends on your version of the story and. That's kind of the basis for a lot of things like I Know What He Did Last Summer, Candyman. A lot of these, um, sl- some slashes come from this. Now, there's even been a Cropsy film made. And he's not real, apparently, but there was an employee at a state school on Staten Island. Um, it was a school for children with disabilities, and he was convicted of kidnapping and potentially harming children. Yeah. And that's where it came from. And then uh, apparently that school shut down. And if you go back there now and you say something like, if you say Cropsy five times, he'll come and get you or something like that. Will he now? He maybe he will. And how's this been proven? Because surely if they've been killed and you said (laughs) it, how's the person ever said that this happened? Someone TikToked themselves as they did it. Did they now? Yeah, but I don't know. We've all heard of Cropsy, though. It is it's an interesting one. Um, and a city like New York is going to have a lot of urban legends, and one of them's got to be some kind of its own sort of Freddy Krueger type killer. Now, something that New York is very famous New for. New York, New York, New York. Is Gav singing? <laughs> is that a song in it? Who sings it? Jay Z. The tunes are made up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So. New York is very, very famous for its sewers, and we're going to be covering more of that when we talk about Chud. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Exactly. Now, one of the things that New York is very famous for in its sewers is alligators. Oh, and there's the alligator. We covered that. Yeah, although that isn't that set in Chicago. But but even so, there is is rumours that people in the 60s and 70s had alligators as pets and then when the law came in the dangerous animal law and everybody got rid of their monkeys and tigers they flushed them down the toilet now in the uk this is true because this is why we have big cats living out in in cornwall and devon you know and they are real it's been proven they are real it's because people got rid of their their and i use the term pet loosely because it, it was like the early 80s, they brought in this law that said, actually, it's really dangerous to have a chimpanzee or a monkey or, or a tiger as a pet. Um, but yes, so the rumour is that people would flush their pets down the toilet. And actually, as far back as 1932, the New York Times reported an alligator was sighted in the Bronx River. And later on in the 30s, uh, some teenagers said they saw one crawl out of a sewer. And throughout the years, people still claim to see alligators. The, the sewer workers that go down there say they see all sorts. And they've claimed to see alligators living in the sewers. It's never been proven, but it's never not been proven either, Gav. Um, and people do still have crazy pets in New York. There is... There yeah, was a story. Dude, tigers and shit. Yeah, there was that story. Uh, There's a photograph. And you can look this up, guys, listening. A photograph of a fireman on a ladder. Yeah, looking looking at it, 
and there's a tiger coming out of the bathroom window at him, like 20 stories up. So somebody had a tiger in their 20-story tiny apartment in, in Brooklyn and wondered why, you know, it's gone a bit crazy. Imagine that, so, Frank, no, no, stop the ladder. Frank, stop the ladder, stop the ladder. <laughs> it's getting closer. What's wrong? The tiger. There's a tiger. <laughs> Just looking at you, waiting for dinner. It's, but yeah, sewer alligators, man crazy um we had the crocodile the bristol crocodile didn't we do yeah, you remember yeah, about this? Yeah, yeah. it's never proven and that story sort of went away after a while but um yeah i think you always hear about these things you hear about goldfish being flushed down the toilet and mutating or ninja turtles however you want to whichever story you want to go down now here's a good one about some ghosts some ice skating ghosts amazing okay so this is the story of the van der Voort sisters now they were spinsters in 1880 and they died within a couple of months of each other they were two crazy old ladies didn't speak to anybody other than themselves sisters and they died within a couple of months of each other and people claim to this day even to spot them one in a red dress and one in a purple dress ice skating in central park on the ice rink nice in the middle of the night just That's skating cool. and people say when they see them it's always the same story their feet they don't have ice skates on their feet aren't touching the ice they're just slightly floating above the cooler. ice can you imagine seeing those two sisters and i'd never heard of them so the van der Voort sisters so if you're ever in new york and you're in i don't know why you'd be in uh, central park at the ice rink at two in the morning unless you're looking to get mugged or murdered or worse um then yeah look out for the van der Voort sisters they'll be ice skating silently slightly above the ice that's pretty cool now let's skip from ghosts to pirates splendid we love pirates Arr. Arr. um so we're talking about Cap- captain kidd he was hanged in 1701 for piracy Holy shit name Captain William Kidd. Uh, he's rumoured to have stashed some pirate treasure on Liberty Island. Captain Kidd sounds like a fucking rapper from 2023, though. He's got <laughs> fucking weird toes on his face. Yeah, it's true. So <clears throat> people are searching, have, have been searching Liberty Island for this gold for centuries, and no one's ever found it. I think it's probably not there if no one's found it by now. Um, but apparently, some people say they've seen pirate apparitions guarding the area that the gold's supposed to be in so i don't know pirate gold the goonies that kind of thing on liberty island it's it's cool these these are all urban legends that new york is famous for another one all of them pretty cool though you know they're all they're all cool aren't they yeah what about um you must have heard of this next one then about um people that have died at the bottom of the Empire State Building because someone's dropped a penny off the top of the Empire State Building. No, no, please tell me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there is a rumour that if you drop a penny or any coin off the top of the Empire State Building, it will build up such a velocity that it will basically act as a bullet by the time it gets to the bottom and it will kill some people instantly. But this has been proven by science to not be possible. It will hurt you. It will really hurt you. The, it wouldn't have a, 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 I bet you it's because of the direct course. It wouldn't have direct course. It'd be going with yeah, movement. It, yeah, because yeah, it hasn't been fired out of a gun. No. Yeah. So it's not real, but it is, it's definitely something I used to hear as a kid. And in fact, even when I went to New York on the top of the Empire State Building, you know, there's gates up and railings, so you could never throw anything off anyway. But I, I even thought of it then. I thought, Christ, imagine if I accidentally dropped my, like, can of Coke and I killed someone, you know? Wow, imagine that. But that one has been debunked. So I'm really sorry. There is no such thing as a killer penny. But what is real is That's the more... It's a shit horror movie, isn't it? The killer penny. The killer walks all the way up to the top and just drops a penny off. It goes back down. It sounds like more like an episode oh. of Columbo. It sounds yeah. more like an episode of Columbo to me. Sarah's getting me the box set for Christmas. What you lucky boy. So excited. Yeah, fucking because for free V. Free V. They just fucking taking them all off. Oh, I hate it when they do the that. Fuckers. Yeah. So let's move on to something you touched on, and that's the, the mole oh, people. Don't tell people. Oh, yeah. The, the city of the mole people. You can tell about the mole people I touched. Don't talk. Don't touch my mole. Oh. The, yeah, the city of mole people. 
So in all the tunnels beneath New York City, there is a society, a city of people known as the mole people, not because they look like moles and they sort of scramble around in the dirt, but because they, they live underground. This is what I was talking about earlier. It's a documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark Days. Exactly. Check it out. It's really good. It's really interesting and it's real. There's all politics and, down there, they're, they're, they're like because they're like neighbours, like legit, like you know, that's my space, that's your space. Don't come into my space. And but also part of that, um, that it's not even an urban legend, but part of that story is what spawned Chud because some of the rumours were before it really got fully investigated some of the rumours were that these were like deformed people that lived down there or, or yeah. cannibals, yeah. that kind of thing so that kind of inspired films like Chud um, but yeah there is a whole city below a city of people that it's, is, it's not anymore but yeah it's crazy, crazy, crazy like Skid Row but underground and people down there like really trying to like some of them really trying to stay clean and they'd cook down there and have like legit clean in kitchen type of thing they'd made and you know there was a there was apparently a church um there right. was doctors that lived down there yeah. it was like all going on yeah would you want would you want to live under new york city well it's rent free but it comes with obviously rape yeah yeah well let's move on to another uh ghost story and I'm talking about the Hudson River ghost ship mm. so when New York was a very small village many many years ago uh, there were reports of a spooky ship seen floating on the Hudson River not it's, a spooky ship seen flood, floating not a ship no the there was a lot of ships floating in the river but not a spooky one that shit it's really creepy and spooky but a ship with a P why would a ship be spooky though a turd why, how could a turd be spooky do you think um, could be sort of white with a ghostly face. Or it could it have like a little fog around it as it went? Yeah, could hmm, be. Maybe. Well, uh, over many, many hundreds of years, people say that if you look carefully and if the if there's enough fog, <laughs> so basically if if you can't see properly, if there's enough fog and it's quite dark, and if you, you short sighted and you take your glasses off, yeah, and, and you, you shut your yourself eyes and poke yourself in the eyes, and you take some drugs, put a blindfold on you will see the Hudson River ghost ship floating around. Now this, what I love about all of these is I'm, this is all reminding me of like Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2 and all the ghosts come out, you know, and start doing Very their Very much thing. Ghostbusters 2, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that one. And the last one, you're going to love this last one. This the last one is called the Bermuda Car Triangle. Splendid. Splendid. Um, now you've heard of the, obviously the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah ships and planes disappear but in Manhattan there is a phenomenon called the the Bermuda (laughs) called the Bermuda car triangle right and it only happened for one year in 2008 (laughs) there was a five block radius near the Empire State Building and any car that would drive into it instantly broke down Wow, is it just like a magnetic field going on there or something it couldn't work it out and the funny thing is tow trucks would come in take the car out and then but when it got out of the radius the car would start back up again but how come the tow trucks are right well this is the flaw in the story isn't it yeah it was only cars Fuck. trucks buses and other things were fine yeah but it it was a phenomenon that people reported in 2008 right. so the bermuda car triangle so that's my list of new york oh, that's very good well, My favourite ones. I bet, Bill, are, I bet Bill liked it because obviously he he's a native. He's telling me to say, "Remember the time I drove the Statue of Liberty using a Nintendo controller?" That's a weird one. That's a weird one, Bill. Um, my favourite out of all of these is definitely sewer alligators. Yeah, um, I love a good s- sewer, sewer story. alligator. Yeah, I love a good sewer alligator. <laughs> uh, Not one of those shit ones. A real good I also sturdy love one. Say, I love good Cropsy as well. I love a good yeah. Cropsy story as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you ever go to New York, Gav... Yeah, definitely. Watch out for these things. Or t- t- check them out or watch out for them. Whatever, you, whatever you fancy. Don't drop your money off the top of the Empire State Building because it won't kill anyone, but you'll be skint. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bill. Dan? There you go. <clears throat> Bill? Take what, us any, out. Any thoughts on that? No, we're not going to talk about that. That's disgusting. No. Take us out of here. Get us out of here. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless Pets. 
weird. Beneath the city of New York are living catacombs, an endless maze of subterranean tunnels, unfit for anything human. Unauthorized for anything experimental. Hold it! There's something moving up ahead in the tunnel! And unlikely to bring anyone down there. So... <coughs> they're coming up. Chud! <coughs> Chud! Check your basement. <coughs> and your bathroom. Keep off the street and try to hide. But remember, the dark is their place. The night is their time. And tomorrow, the only things living in the city of New York will be Chud. Chud. Cannibalistic, humanoid, underground dwellers. Chud. They're not staying down there anymore. Chud from 1984. A bizarre series of sudden disappearances on the streets of New York City seems to point towards something unsavory, like a sausage roll living in the sewers. I, I added the There's like no a sausage, sausage roll. roll. There's no sausage roll living in the sewers. <laughs> Yeah, Chud. <clears throat> Funny enough, I only seen this for the first time with Sarah last year, and we didn't get to the end because 10 minutes of the ending on Amazon Prime went. And the soundtrack just went like slow mo, like proper slow mo. And I was like, what the fuck? But I thought it was a stole choice. And after a while, I was like, <clears throat> nah. Robert Foster is not talking. Robert Foster? No. Uh, no, he's, he's an alligator. Alligator, I think of. The dude in this. Uh, 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 John Hurt? John Hurt. Kevin McAllister's dad. Yeah, uh, uh, does not talk. You know, doesn't talk like that. But yeah, anyway, um, um, I was actually more familiar and had on videotape and watched it quite a lot. Chud 2, but the Chud. Totally yeah. type of different type of movie. Horror comedy, where some uh, college kids think it would be good for a prank to take a corpse from the uh, the medical school, uh, uh, the mortuary, and um, it happened, and then we revive it, I think, and it happens to be then class as Chud 2. Nothing like it, Well, it wasn't It wasn't really anything to do with Chud. They no, just no, added no. that to the title and turned it into just a sequel. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we've seen that type of film lots of times, um, haven't we? Um, yeah. Vamp, and there's a bunch of movies where they two kids do a college prank and then it all goes wrong. There's, um, a, there's a bunch. No, the creeps. Yeah, I suppose, maybe there's that should be a subgenre. Yeah, college pranks gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so this one, yeah, Chad, yeah, um, a cannabisic humanoid, a humanoid underground dweller. Yeah, or contaminated. Uh, what was the other thing it stands for? Contaminated. Oh, there's another thing it stands for as well that they talk about in this. <laughs> It's it's a cool, it's a cool name, having C H U D Chud. It's yeah. quite, it's it's great for a video shop, that's for sure. And and especially because you see the word, and then underneath it you see cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller, and you think, okay, wow, that tells me everything I need to know. And the fact that then on the front cover there was a little sewer peeking up, but instead of a friendly ninja turtle peeking out, you've got these glowing eyes and a claw coming out. And again, this is one of those ones I mentioned earlier, you see it in the video shop and you want to know what that's about. Now, I was talking to our buddy RJ McCready about this earlier today, and I said, I've got a bit of a story with this one because... It was one of the ones that I always wanted to rent. And then I feel bad that I tricked my mum into renting it for me because she said, oh, no, it's an 18. I'm not going to let you watch that one. And one afternoon, I said to her, please, please, mum, like, look, I think it's related to the Ninja Turtles. Look at the look at the front cover. And she thought, oh, if it's got something coming out of the sewer, then he's probably right. It wasn't and then I watched it and I was kind of was a bit scared of watching it but it's it's one that I definitely saw as a kid probably a bit too young and it's probably the better of the two films that, that we're covering in this episode but again it's got a really great plot mm -hmm. 
a lot of um, political undertones in this to do with, you know, the underground, the, the, the homeless people, the real, yuppies. It's got a real life pixie in it. Real life pixie? There's a lady who looks like a pixie. Does she? Yeah. Oh. Short grey hair. Her. Oh, yes. Yeah, she does a bit, doesn't she? she well, it looks like a pixie. Is that all I could get my head around? Last time it was Brian May's hair, and this time it's a pixie. And it's got a fantastic score as well. Uh, a really yeah. memorable score. Uh, I wouldn't say memorable, but I'd say unique and uh, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's got its own score, like you sort of its own, you know, motif. And it's got some good acting in it. And let's talk about those actors briefly. Um, John, the two main... John Goodman, very quickly, just throw that in there. Just his first time ever role as a cop, not acting fairly decent actually. But not um, of a nice cop either. No, a bit of a bit of a pervert. Yeah, uh, but then gets killed straight away. Um, but you only just see, see a slight reaction. That's it. But um, just go, just threw that in there like that. And then we get a bit of a Home Alone reunion because we've got Marv from Home Alone, uh, one of the burglars, uh, Daniel Stern as the sort of the the ambassador for the homeless people and then you've got john hurd kevin McAllister's dad who is a photographer um in new york and they sort of team up along with another guy called captain bosch Bosch, who, who he, is really badly cast he's I, he's a great character though he's not good he's not well cast he is like a poor man's Tom Atkins. It's just he has nothing. He has nothing going on. It's very like. Uh... I like him though. I really like the character. Um, I don't know. He's probably my favourite character in it. I don't know. So uh, like I don't a, know. Need like a Christopher George or something. But yeah, he, so he plays Christopher. Um, sorry, he's played by Christopher Curry. So you've got three sort of main guys, and then you've got also got Lauren, who is Daniel Hurd's. Um, girlfriend who's a model as well so we've got a good little cast in this it's great plot and there's a lot of political undertones like i say a lot of commentary on class um the yuppies and all that kind of stuff going on it is interesting speaking of the cast um that there is a couple of people in it who well three people really gone on to have big acting careers yeah like John Goodman as well. I know that's very much just almost a cameo. Um, but it's quite interesting where that came from. And that must be in the production or the cast and agents or whatever. But not not bad, you know. And they play very different characters to where they end up, you know. They all end up going into sort of family comedies, a lot of those guys, apart from John Goodman. Um, so, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I really like it. Um, there was a sequel that we just touched about, but it was nothing to do with this one. So if you're going to watch Bud the Chud... I and mean, that's a great title, Bud the Chud, but it's nothing to do with this. This is about things living underground, and this taps into that underground um, in the sewers thing, but also it taps into the mutated radiation type thing as well, which was big in the big in the fifties actually, but also came back a little bit in the seventies and eighties with deformed creatures. Um, now the spoiler spoiler here straight away is is that these creatures are actually the the homeless people that the government have mutated by dumping loads of chemicals underground and radioactive waste. And over the course of however many years, these poor homeless people have turned into these cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers that the government then try and cover up. So, again, it's like a bit of an anti-government punk vibe to it, which was very New York in the early 80s. Punk, anti-government, anti-establishment. So he's in the 80s, it's fuck New York government. Yeah, fuck them, fuck the man. So we start off with the score, which I mentioned, and we start off with a dog, a lady walking her dog in the middle of the night. I don't know why she's out late walking her dog. Yeah, it's a big, big, wide open shot of an empty road. It looks quite nice, actually. Um, and we see a sewer lid slide open, and a claw grabs her ankle. She screams. Dog runs off. Title card, Chud. Chud. There we are. Now, that lady is someone that will come back because it turns out that she's actually the wife of Captain Bosch. Bosch. Um, boy, Bish Bash Bosch. Bosch. So, but we'll find that out in a few scenes' time. So there we go. There's your first bit. All that's left of her is a shoe. We see lots of the streets in New, New, New York now yeah. uh, in the daytime and a, uh, a, a trash lorry, one of the uh, brushes at the side of the street sweeper. Street machine. sweeper. It's going along and we follow that for a little while, actually. 
Yeah, and it sweeps up the lady's shoe. Last bit of evidence that she was ever there and her shoe's gone. And um, we see all the homeless people. We see Kevin McAllister's dad. Who's a um, really annoying photographer who's such a, like egotistical stuck up his own arse. He's got this... So basically, his story is I'm that... I'm an artist. Yeah, he's an artist, and he's got Don't this project you know. that he's doing on the homeless people of New York, and he's got a relationship with some of them as well, and he's friends with them all, and they, they let him into his world, and he takes these sort of documentary pictures, but no one's interested in that at the moment. People just want to pay him to take pictures of models naked, and he, so he does that to make his money. But he's, when he's doing it, you know, even when his girlfriend is doing a perfume ad advertisement, he's still really sort of against it all. And he's like, man, this isn't what I'm I'm here to do. I'm here to take, you know, I'm here well, to document the world. I tried and- to, yeah, well, I tried to figure out this. He's, he's done that. But I guess on the side, she says, will you take photos for me? Or he, I, I think it, or it would be he's been like, look, if you're doing eight pictures where you're taking clothes off or anything like that, I don't want... But then he's like, oh, what are we doing today? Oh, are we doing today ones where you take them off? So that means he's a photographer all the time. But does that mean when she gets the gig, when her agent gets her the gig, does she go, the, <clears> my <throat> stipulation is that my boyfriend has to take his photos? Do you know what I mean? That's going to be... Yeah. Companies could be like, no, fuck off. Or, we would pick could- the photographer. It could just be that they it's, either it's some weird. models do have their own photographer as well, so it could be that. But also, it could just be so that they they move in package. the similar circles. It could be I don't know. Might be just as a package <clears> to just do these gigs. But he's so like I'm fucking the shit, and it's just like, he can't see past it. And it's a bit like oh come on man, it's very childish actually in a way. Um, but the first time he talks to his girlfriend, she is putting makeup on her bottom because she's got a pimple on her butt cheek. Yep. And he's laughing at her, and she says, I've got to go off and have my butt photographed today, so I can't have a pimple on there. He's got and a he... phone, sorry. And she says, Where am I? where's my jewellery? And he says, well, it's in the basement. She says, what, so you've brought all your photographic equipment up here, because they've just moved into this apartment, but you haven't brought up any of mine. And he's just like, go get it yourself. He's a bit of a dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's got a deadline as a phone message for him, because he doesn't answer the phone, because he's too big for that. Um, and uh, he's got a deadline which this dude keeps hassling him for through the, <clears throat> out the film and she goes to the basement he's an collect- artist don't you know don't you know she goes to the basement to collect her jewellery and she hears a scratching sound coming from a grating it's like the fucking rats up here like the rats above Gav's head <laughs> scratchy scratchy the chance we might hear them at some point and then her neighbour outside, her neighbour sees something in the trash pile moving and screams. So we get the sense that there's definitely something under the gr- underground already. Ooh. Ooh. Cut to the police headquarters, the cop shop. And cop t- Captain Bosch is there and there's more and more reports coming in of missing people. But... Because they're homeless people, they don't really keep too much of a track of them. And in fact, some of the police say, it's not that important, though, if a few homeless people go missing, is it? Uh, We've skipped past short-haired pixie lady. Of course. Sorry, I do Uh, apologise. Yeah, it's her, uh, his Um, neighbour. She's she's the one that sees the trash pile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She does look like a uh, pixie. Little pixie, yeah. She's the landlady of the whole building, isn't she? Oh, is she? Yeah. Right. So the police basically don't really Bosch. care that all, they don't really care that all these people are going missing. Dick but Bosch. Uh. But, but Cap- no, but Captain Bosch, he's Dick been Bosch. a good captain that he is. He suspects there's more to this story. And actually, we find out his wife's been missing for a day. And she was the lady at the beginning who was dragged into the sewer by, by a chud. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so he's, he's, he goes to his captain and he says, look, I know you think that it doesn't count, but there's so many underground people that are, are moving, that are disappearing and uh, vanishing. I think there's more to this. Um, we've, got, we've got to investigate this. They should make a horror version of the Wombles. <laughs> I did not expect you to come out with that. Rob Zombies, the Wombles. The Zombles. <sighs> Rob Zombles. Rob Zombles. I'm going to change my name to Rob Zombles. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Robert Zombles. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, 
do you think like when he goes places people are like, oh mr zombie nice to meet you yeah they, yeah they can have to he's would have, oh. i presume he's changed his name legit what a dickhead to show moon zombie moon yeah. moon zombie yeah oh god <laughs> How do we always come up to back to Rob Zombie? I don't know. But bl- bless them, they're doing whatever they want and they're happy. So they bring this crazy homeless man in and they interview him and Captain Bosch is speaking to him and he says, Dick Bosch. come on, tell me what's going on. Then he says, creatures, there's creatures underground. And he just pulls out this big giant knife in the middle of the police station and starts stabbing it into the table. And... Um, Rather than sort of shoot him or arrest him, they sort of all just back off and go, oh, gosh, he's got a bit of a story to tell, hasn't he? <laughs> it bit, doesn't, but... doesn't feel like the typical uh, uh, film American cop we would see in who's trigger happy. Um, so uh, George, who is John Hurd, who is Kevin McAllister's dad, he's got a relationship with this person and he bails them out. I love you had to explain to three different categories of people there, the Home Alone <laughs> fans, the... Uh... The, the people who know him by his acting name <laughs> and his character in this, um, he bails her out because he's he's got a bit of a relationship with her and you know she's he takes photos of her, which all sounds very creepy, but he's doing it for his sort of documentary sort of thing that he's doing his project. And um, she says like, "What what were you doing? Why did you get arrested?" And she says, "Oh, I tried to take that cop's gun. I need it for self defence. There's things going on underground." That you know, all us guys, us, us homeless guys, we need weapons, so guns, knives, anything we can. We need to defend ourselves. So he says, "Well, look, let me walk you back to the the cave that you live in, <laughs> like the opening to the entrance to the underground bit." So while they're walking along, another cop starts following him because he suspects. Hmm, why is he bailed her out? This is all a bit weird. I'm going to follow this guy and see what's going on. Before, be very, 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 very quick, jumping back very much, uh, Daniel Stern is uh, talked to by uh, old Dick. Uh, Dick, whatever his name is. What's his, his name, name his Bosch. name's Captain, Bo- Captain Bosch, his name is. Captain Bosch is, is talked to, and um, he explains to him that um, I've got a group of people I've not seen recently. The homeless group, it's like 12 of them, I've not seen them for like two weeks, and they come up here every day for soup, and I have not seen them. And it's only underground people, do you understand? Only the underground ones. So, yeah. so that mystery element is thrown in there as well. Yeah, because he, he's called the Reverend Daniel Stern because he's a bit of a like a cult leader. He yeah, basically so he's doing good deed. The detective is like kind of like what are you up to. Admittedly, I don't know his backstory, but the detective's like a bit of a dick at first. Yeah, but then he realizes all this guy is he's trying to do is good. feed these yeah. these homeless people. Yeah. And and he knows them all so well. He knows that some of them don't like to come out, so he he leaves like sandwiches in certain holes for them in the ground so that they can come and eat it and stuff. He's a good guy, and he's those rats would have them straight away. They would. The chuds will definitely eat them. Basket case will probably put some in a camp. Uh, a thing. What would happen if basket case and chud um, sort of bumped into each other in a tunnel under New York? Uh, uh, that'd be it. I actually think basket case might win. Maybe. <clears throat> he's, a bit of, kick him, though. he's a bit of a Football. psycho. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. He tells him it's only the people that live underground, the other homeless people that live on the streets. They're not disappearing. It's the, the people underground. So this is all sort of tied together now. Um, but yeah, so going back to where we were, sorry, you're right. I did jump ahead a little bit there. So he, he walks her back to her thing and they go through some tunnels together and Kevin McAllister sort of like, oh god, why am I crawling for all this shit? The dude, the, dude, the reason they go down there, well, they get to. I think the dude who's got the real bad cut where they get to when they get to their yeah. point. He's got That's the sh- whitest teeth ever for, for like, a homeless, a homeless dude. Yeah. <laughs> so what the fuck? Well, they go through lots of tunnels, some big, some tiny. Um, we see lots of different people living underground. Bosch, Bosch says, he says, why have we got such interest in this man? And Bosch says, like, oh, my wife, she went missing. Yeah, that's right. And they they met. They also meet Victor, who's underground with the injury. He's got pretty bad. He says, "Have you got a gun? I want a gun." His leg is really fucked because he's been attacked by a chud. Although we don't know what they're called at this point, but he's been attacked. So yeah, Bosch, his wife is missing, and they start to discuss this EPA probe, which is uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's investigation that's been going on. Now, it should have only gone on for two weeks, but it's been going on for about six weeks. 
So they, the government obviously think there's more under New York than just, you know, the usual two weeks, make sure there's nothing bad under there, which they do once a year, and that's it. They find a Geiger counter and pick it up, <laughs> and it goes off the chain. It's a bit like straight away, you'd be like, get the fuck out of here, let's go. I, I love this team up now where you've got this, like, leader of the homeless guys yeah. and Captain Bosch. I just wish the detective was better cast. I know what you mean, but that, that, that really side is... Good. It's a cool little detective story, almost, this part of it, really. You know, there's a murder mystery. You're like, what's happened then? Yeah, Why it, is there a guy going It's so? a shame because it could have been... Uh, all the other casting is pretty good. It's a real shame. Yeah, and then we end that scene with a growling sound and they sort of get the fuck out of there. Now, Kevin McAllister's model girlfriend tells him she is pregnant. Yep. And they discuss it. What do we do? What do we do? And she says, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want, I want to keep it. And she's like, well, then we'll keep it. So they're very happy. <laughs> yeah. He ain't going to give a fuck about that kid. I'm no. too busy. I'm taking pictures. He is not going to give a shit and they're going to break up. That's it. I've seen it, seen it in the cards already. So we get a little bit of backstory for those two there. So we now know that she is pregnant. So we get that extra little bit of vulnerability for her character throughout this film. Early stages, but even so, she's still pregnant. Cut to an old man and a little girl, which sounds weird, but let me... <laughs> yeah. Um, they get they get lost. They're lost in New York, like Home Alone 2. And they yeah. go in a phone booth... And he rings up um, whoever he's calling and says, look, we're, we're lost. We don't know where we are. Can you come and collect us? I'm, I've got my granddaughter with me here. Can somebody come and help us, please? And while this is happening, she spots, the little girl spots a chud coming out of the sewers. And uh, she's scared. But before she can say anything to her grandpa... We see gets, its face. Yeah. <laughs> Very quickly. It's great, though. It looks good. Yeah, it's got, like, um, bright yellow eyes that sort of go in different directions. Yeah, I was into it. It's like a cross between Nosferatu and, um, I don't know, really. It's just a very slimy-looking monster. Looks good. Not what I remembered them looking like, as well. In my head, they're more like the basket case. But yeah. um, they're not. They're actually, like, well, humanoid. <laughs> Cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. Yeah. Um so yeah, another death, uh, and then we, the little girl was in the police station, and they're saying, "Bosh, this man, this old, this little girl says a monster ate her grandfather," and he's like, "What? Right, we're going to start a search immediately," and he springs into action, and he starts a uh, you know assembling a crew of people, and they were looking at him like, "What on earth? Why is he so into this like story about Avengers. a monster?" <laughs> Avengers assemble. Judd, Judd Basher is a symbol. Judd Basher. <laughs> <laughs> that could be another thing. Um, at school, when I was uh, at school, if someone was a bit of a sort of, if you wanted to call someone a name, you'd sort of go, oh, you're such a chud. We used to call people chuds. Oh, really? You're such a chud. Ugh. Same, same sort of time as we used to call people stig. Dweeb? Mm. We'd call people dweebs, dorks, chuds. All these sort of things. Mm. Dickheads. <laughs> Grebo, that was all. Oh, we never really had Grebo. Yeah, Grebo. We didn't, we didn't have that one. It's stuck for one of my friends, though. He's still called Grebo. Homeless oh. now, funny enough. Oh, poor guy. Is he cannibalistic? I don't know. I'll Is he hum humanoid? <laughs> <laughs> Last time I saw him. <laughs> Christ. Uh, so yeah, so Captain Bosch springs into action and um, he goes to talk to Marv again from Home Alone <laughs> and he says, um, Marv says, right, that's it. We're going to go and speak to the man. We need to present some evidence to city office and tell them about all these homeless people that are missing and that there's more to this story than meets the eye. And now a grandfather's been killed as well. And Bosch says, yeah, don't forget my wife as well. They're like, right, let's go. Let's go to City Hall and tell them about this. And they're going to show the Geiger counter as well and explain about the radioactivity. It gets very, very tense, but they're not, they're kind of, their story isn't really fully listened to, as you would expect. It's kind of like when the Ghostbusters go speak to the mayor. Yeah. It's that kind of story. No one's interested in it. Uh, meanwhile, Lauren and George celebrating their um, pregnancy while having some champagne in the park. Probably not a good idea for her to be drinking, to be honest, but. 
Yeah. It was the 80s. Yeah, the 80s, different rules. And while they're having their picnic, a reporter sneaks up on them and says... Mr. Way's coat from before. Yeah, he says, listen, I need to speak to you. The police have been tailing you and they want to know what your connection to these homeless people is. There's a story at work here. I'm a reporter and there's something going on with the homeless people going missing. It's something to do with radioactive waste. But they want to hide the evidence. They want don't want anyone to know about it. You interested? You interested? Mm-hmm. He says, I want to know all about these bums. Bums? Oh, yeah. the homeless people. Yeah, not your bum. <laughs> in the bottom. <laughs> you perked my interest, sir. I want to know about your bum. He says, we think it's something nuclear. It's it's all it's, it's something's going down. So he he piques um, Kevin McAllister's interest here because he's although he's a photographer, he's a bit of a a journalist as well, isn't he? He kind of documents what's going on with these homeless people, and he's got an interest in it as well. So he thinks, hmm, okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll listen to this reporter and see what's going on. Yeah. So back in the office, they're discussing the sightings of a monster. Now, they've got all of the, the, the mayor and all of the people from high up in the city. And in this room, you've got Captain Bosch, Bosch. and then a, ho- a homeless-looking guy with a suitcase full of weird photos. You're not going to listen to what these guys are saying, that they're telling no. you there's monsters under the city. No, you're not. So you've got to admire Bosch for trying. It's a bit weird where he thinks I'll take this homeless dude in with me. He's going to uh, help. Well, they so um, they he finds the file because Marv kicks off and he runs out of the office and he finds the Bosch finds a file with Chud written on the top of it and he says, "What is this? What's this about? Cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller? What on earth is this?" Um, and they take Bosch down to a mortuary and say look this is just between you and us but this is this is a creature that we think has killed some people and it's pretty cool because you don't see the creature really you see it in reflection of his hazmat suit don't you oh because it all goes a bit predator too they just send these guys down there and they're they're up on a screen watching them it's so predator too Oh, yeah, but that, that's in just a moment, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Before that, though, Marv is outside and he's trying to make a phone call. Oh, you mean when they go down, they say they've caught one and they go yeah, down yeah. and they actually look at it? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's very show. much. Yeah, it's just a reflection of it, yeah. And, but I, while, while that's going on, there's a weird moment where Marv is trying to make a phone call, but because he's been tailed by these like FBI guys, one of them just takes the, the penny off of him so he can't put it in the phone, uh, the pay phone, and he just swallows the coin. It doesn't say anything. Is that one of Bosch's guys? Yeah. Yes, but yeah, because the reason why, basically, Bosch is told not to send any guys down there because he goes, okay, just send some people down there. He goes, whoa, 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 how would you know that's the only one? And he goes, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. He, it's says, fine. he it's says it died one. from Don't gas worry. choke, yeah. choked on gas. So it'd be fine. So just send our guys go down there. So then Bosch, Bosch, is all like, uh, all sneaky like and gets his group of men to stand there all ready. Yeah, because like he says I, commando I, team. He says I want to send a crack unit down there with flamethrowers, <laughs> not just like gas? with guns. What if there is gas though? <laughs> Isn't that really a bad idea? Yes, it's. I want to send them with flamethrowers, and I want them wearing shell suits. Get Anything Bosch. highly flammable. Go please. home. Go home. Go direct traffic, Bosch. Don't worry, they'll have a canary with them. Um, he wants to send them down. That's to why the they've slippers. got the gas masks. He says, just in case there's more than one of them, because he now knows that there's definitely at least one one of these monsters. But they overrule him and say, no, that's not happening. Yeah, probably We're sending don't, our- don't send down, down flamethrowers. They've got gas marks because there's gas. So it's a good little chess move here now because they override him and they say, we've got our own men going down there now. And while they're down there on their, their with their video cameras, suddenly all of Bosch's dudes show up with flamethrowers and they're like who are these guys and he's like <laughs> they're my men and they're like no no you can't have them down here and he says they're not happy about i'm not happy what, with Bosch. what are you gonna do about it yeah we're I'm already a cop. here but again though 
there's a reason there's gas flamethrowers bad I didn't think of it until now ridiculous well, well he says to them what are you going to do your men have got video cameras my men have got flamethrowers brilliant who um, would win <laughs> so yeah it has gone all Predator 2 really has um, one thing those cameras would be really fucking heavy yeah another thing is you'd need a long cable it's 1984. You're not talking You're about not a little pocket it. phone. You're not transmitting it. Yeah. And if you are, it's going to take run off so much battery. You'd need electric, probably. So it's going to probably be wired. Yeah. Well, they 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 actually come across a chud and they burn it, um, but it seems to survive the fire, um, and it starts killing the cameraman. It's a bit like aliens as well. The cam- yeah, cameras cool. will shut off. It's funny because this is before aliens, so yeah. it's kind of cool actually. Um, uh, they lose camera signal probably because of all the leads I'm guessing probably yeah. really, really long leads well they take this footage of these men dying back to City Hall and say right I told you there was something going on down there there's creatures down there they've just killed a bunch of government officials uh, I want permission to go to war against these chuds these cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. Go, go to war? <laughs> yeah, I want to go to war. That's a bit much. Um, now, George, Kevin McAllister, dad, he realises someone's broken into his apartment while all this is going on because in order to get the evidence they needed, Marv and Captain Bosch... Bosch. ...have broken into his apartment Did and stolen all, stolen all of the photos of homeless people. So he, he's like, where the hell are all my photos? This is crazy. And he says to his uh, girlfriend, have you seen them? And she's like, no, I don't know where they are. And he's like, well, someone's broken into our apartment. Marv and Bosch meet up again. Bosch. Dick Bosch. Stop saying this. <laughs> I'll help it. Uh, if you're drinking while you listen, every time Gav says Bosch in a particular way, please take a swig. Uh, so Bosch tells Marv about the monster autopsy and says i've seen one of them they're real they showed me the body um this is this is real and i'm getting i'm putting together a war i'm getting a war started against these chud things underground it's like like, it's like a jaws moment where they go right let's just go down there now it's like uh let's go like out now in the water like in jaws at one point we're drunk yeah let's do it let's go Let's go. What now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, So they go to the sewer. Meanwhile, while that's happening, George and the reporter go to the sewer as well. So they're going to go down there and find out what's going on. But the reporter gets killed by a chud. Chud time. It's chud time, baby. Chud chow. Chud chow. Um, Bosch in City Hall finds out that the government are going to flood sewers with gas and he's thinking I've got flamethrowers down there, this isn't good (laughs) Uh, and what they're planning to do is just gas them all, any that might be left over, but what they don't realise is is that the reporter and Marv are down there, uh, sorry the reporter and Kevin McAllister's dad are down there so they're going to kill some innocents as as well as all the homeless people that live down there and this is the point that they don't care about the homeless people. No. They just want to hide the problem, hide the nuclear waste, isn't, hide the mutation. Isn't hiding the problem from the government of the homeless something they've always done? Mm, yeah, really. Yeah. Oh, Gav's getting political, guys. Oh, anything else you want to say? No, no, no. I love it. Um, yeah, Chud kills the reporter, George runs off, um, and Marv tries to find another exit... And he sees, he, he accidentally comes across like six chuds who seem to be doing some kind of like ritual, like they're praying or, or doing something. They've got, all got their arms up in the air and they're all sort of going. Um, yeah, but that's they, a really cool moment. I wish I'd lingered on that for longer. It's really cool. He peeps around the corner, doesn't he? It's and like he's, 70s Italian. And then he goes back, and then he sneaks out. But then he he accidentally makes a noise with his foot, and they all turn around. So he runs off. Uh, cut back to pregnant Lauren, who's she's now found this trapdoor in her basement. She thinks, hmm, 
Don't you go in that trap Trap door. Is there something down? There was a there was an animated kids show for anyone who's not from the UK. There's an animated kids show. Um, Claymotion. Clay yeah, Claymotion, stop motion animation. About um, it was called Trap Door, and it was brilliant. Each episode was only four minutes long, and it was about a, a guy called Burke, a uh, big round blue creature and he basically lived in a castle with bones was it? and he had a little skull called bony yeah. um and upstairs you never heard what what you never saw him but you only ever heard his voice he always wanted feeding so burke would have to get something out the trap door for him in each episode and every episode something would come out a different animal creature ghost zombie you whatever to sort it was it out and get it back in it was brilliant it was so simple yeah that's it that was it but yeah, that's what we were singing there. Trapdoor. Yeah, it'd be on YouTube. Easy to find. Yeah. St- Stoner, Stoners, you love it. <laughs> but yeah, she decides it's probably a good idea to go down into this trapdoor underneath her basement. And she finds the dead dog from yep. the beginning of the film. Yep. So she screams. She's not happy about it. Um, morning comes and Bosch and the cops have been called out. <laughs> this is brutal. Been called to the, the docks because uh, someone's found a body. It's all right. His acting doesn't make it fit seem brutal, so it's fine. And as they get closer, one of the cops says, Oh my God, it's his wife's head. It's Bosch's wife's head. Just that. Oh. Bosch isn't too bothered. It's fine. So, well, well he, he is because he goes straight to a bar and gets absolutely shit faced. Yeah. And the cops are like, uh, should we just take you home, sir? And he's like, no, no, no. I'm just going to have another drink. It's fine. <sighs> um, meanwhile, Lauren you calls... That's the- better than him. Thank Sorry. Uh, meanwhile, um, Lauren calls the cops and says, there is a, mu- a mutilated dog under my-, my basement. Someone's put it there. Please, it's creeping me out. Can someone come? And while she's on the phone, something creeps out of her trap. So, because she feels a bit dirty, Gav, and because it's a 1984 film, she decides to go and have a shower. She's dirty. Something's fought the corner out of her trapdoor. She's dirty, so she can go and have a shower. All sorts of wrong here. So, she's having a lovely shower, and suddenly the shower plug seems to be clogged up, doesn't it? Yeah. She thinks, oh dear, I'll have to put my hands down here and unclog this uh, this drain. Let's unclog it. And loads of blood fires out of the shower drain Thought into cool. her face. Always good. Always good. Blood splurts in the face. And here is John Goodman in the next scene in his first ever film. Leching on a woman. Yeah. So he's a cop with some other cops in a bit of a, he's a got cafe. Some, he's got some quick, quick comebacks. Yeah, she says, oh, you're you think, really asking for it. Do you think it. he came up with this himself? I'm not sure. There's one point where he's really flirting with the bum and serving them, and she says, oh, you're really asking for it. And he says, <laughs> I've been asking for it all my life. I just never get it. It's like, what are you, are you being a real pervert? You're supposed to be a cop. What's going on? Well, anyway, he gets his comeuppance because just before he can eat his cheeseburger and say any more perverted lines. He reacts. He reacts to something. That's it. And That's it. Some, some chuds come in, and... They're massacred. All the cops. Well, we, the lady no, were... we don't know that. We don't see well, any of that. We, we see that a bit later on. Yeah. So he's out of unfortunately. Uh, my note here says the chuds surround the hamburger bar. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. We just hear lots of screaming. If you're in there eating a hamburger, it's a good burger. You're like, man, this comes in top ten, and you're like. This could be top five of all bugs and like this could be top three. And at that point you're just going down to go, could this be top one? At that point, chuds of attacking outside. Do you're you not con- even looking. do you continue the burger? Are you, you dirty think, Harry? You think I can die happy because I've eaten the best burger in true, New York. True. True. I don't care if eat these chuds eat me. Then then worry about it. Worry about it with indigestion in a moment. Now we get a real Italian sort of style scene next with a little boy who is playing in his apartment the same apartment block that the chuds have come out of the sewers in and he hears banging on the door something's trying to get in his apartment and he thinks oh i'll unlock it unlock it but he can't reach it no and then his mum's like jimmy jimmy come and get your dinner don't trust that kid that kid's gonna be running the street as soon as he can 
He's never heard of Stranger Danger, is he? He's just he's getting in people's vans left, right, and centre. Like for three and a half. Well, he runs off to his dinner, but then he runs back at the last minute because he forgot his toy car. But um, luckily, he nothing happens. And as he runs off into the other room, the door bursts open and the Chud's arms come through. <laughs> so, so there's now a Chud. <laughs> Brilliant Chud impression. So there's now a Chud bursting into his apartment and probably other apartments in the block as well. Now back at the diner, we see the aftermath of the thing they never sh- they showed us. Uh, all the press are there, all the reporters, cops, and it's a bloodbath. There's blood everywhere. There's Dead a cops. radio DJ like sort of saying over the top to make the plot even a little bit more like, whoa, what's going on here? They're sort of saying like, there's a, uh, there's, it's really weird. There's, uh, there's no bodies, there's no witnesses, just blood everywhere. Yeah, and they sort of say, oh, it's a gas. I think it's a gas explosion. Why is it gas every time? <laughs> It's like weather balloons. Whenever something happens Maybe to the government, guess. are like, it's a weather balloon. It's like it's, it's, it's like a, a airplane gag or something. Do you know what I mean? Blame, blame it on gas. Blame it on gas. It's just gas. It's no, gas. I saw the chud. The chud ate my leg in front of me. No, that was just gas. gas. It was gas. It's just gas, my friend. Just gas. Uh, but yes, blood everywhere, no bodies. Um, meanwhile, George is still underground, and he finds lots and lots and lots of dead bodies. Um, he finds half a homeless person. You what, sorry? Oh, yeah, he finds half... A, I, I thought you said I was half a homeless person. Once. I thought you were revealing something to me. Which half? It's like a, a sexual thing I get. I sort of dress half of me, sort of more like fre- more Freddy clothes, you know, sort of different clothing. I was once half of a band's mine horse. I was once half of a homeless person. Yeah. Great. Um, so the plan to pump the gas into the series is still going ahead. Bosch tries to stop it because he also knows that his buddies are under there. Um, and Lauren sees all of this happening on the news. And they again, they say a gas explosion is to blame for all these dead cops in a grill bar. Now, is it, though? Is it really? So the Chuds start coming after Lauren. Um, she blocks the door. And now we cut backwards and forwards between her and what's going on at the diner here um, and the surrounding area because uh, the cops get killed. Um, George and Mar find uh, some nuclear waste. So this is the cause of it all. Yep. It, and what's been happening for years is that the government have just been chucking all their nuclear waste under New York. No, just not, not. Not caring about what happens to it, who it mutates into a chud or anything. Don't care about giant alligators or ninja turtles or chuds living under the sewers. No. Don't care. Don't care about the homeless people. But they just they need to find a way to let people know that they're underground. Come back to uh, Lauren's apartment and you can really see the chuds like really clearly here and they look great. Yeah, there it is really good practical effects. Yeah, mutants um, with red eyes. Yeah, it's and it's a guy in a suit, but just looks great. Oh, and one of them's head kind of really stretches far out, which is really weird. And yeah, she neck. Get, and she just gets a, a bat and just, or a sword. Well, she gets something and she cuts it off. She gets a samurai sword off. Oh, uh, cool. And she chops its head off. And it's a great shot. And in fact, the looks head good. looks great when it rolls across the ground and the eyes are still sort of glowing. Yeah. Uh, it just so happens they have a samurai sword hanging on the wall. Yeah. Um, it's good, good to have one of those, just in case. Uh, dude escapes from the drains. Yeah, well, don't forget, Lauren steals the police car. She's such a badass that she steals a police car because she wants to go and rescue, you know, her her bloke. Mm. So she's stolen a police car amongst all of this nonsense. Um, yeah, they want to get out, but they park a car on top of the sewer, the police do, so that the guys can get out of the sewers. Um, Bosch gets shot. And it always... You know, like some films, we say they they... The third act was a bit... It dragged a bit too much. Yeah. For me, the third act goes too quickly. It all happens so quickly. It wraps up in the last 15 minutes. So much goes on. I found Um, it dragging myself. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, they eventually fight their way out. Um, The guy that... The the sort of... Not the mayor, but the the man in in the office is trying to stop all of this and cover it all up. He rams his truck at them. Why? Oh, yeah, because he's trying to cover up. Yeah, but they they end up shooting him. Um, the whole truck explodes. 
Bosch is actually still alive, even though he got shot. He's lying there on the ground. Marv's helping him. And Lauren and George kiss as the van burns behind them. Quite a nice shot. And real practical. They actually set a van on fire. Again, you wouldn't do these, these do that these days, but they set a van on fire and they just kissed right in front of it. Oh. And that's it. That's it. What happened to the chuds? They all got burnt and exploded in the fire. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we feels like we rushed through that, but that is because it snowballs so quickly that the third act it just bounces along at such a pace. And it's quite a short film anyway. I think it's only about 80 minutes long. They didn't have a um, huge amount to speak of it, really. It was okay-ish. Okay. I, again, I, for me, the... The plot is really good. Um, I love the whole government cover-up. I love that kind of stuff. Throwing stuff in the sewers, throwing radiation and, and things being mutated. Love all of that. <clears throat> My biggest problem is we there aren't enough chuds in this. I want more chuds, Gav. More chuds. That'll be on my um, great I would like to have seen more of the chuds. Absolutely, that would be splendid. Um... I think that's the best way they should have gone with it. More of that stuff. Um, I, I think a film could have been a fucking amazing classic, but I feel like it was handled okay, but not amazingly. You know, it's like it's all right, but it people, could have been like, man, that's a great movie. People wouldn't really have got it because back then, probably because it was so anti the man. People didn't want that in their horror films. They just wanted. A to B. They didn't want to understand a government cover-up. Well, I don't know. Um, no, around then you would have had quite a lot of government cover-up movies, which would have been the zeitgeist, definitely, with Watergate-type things going on. Mm, yeah, but bit. but I do think this is the kind of... If, if you went in to watch this, you're not the kind of audience member that would be wanting that, right? Like, like a f teenage boy oh, yeah, is going yeah, yeah. to watch this. So that's probably why it didn't... It's become a cult classic on VHS, you know, over time. Yeah, I, I um, think I actually have it on VHS, but I couldn't... Um, it's hard to get to, but I'm pretty sure I have got it on VHS. Nice. Well, it's a, it's definitely one that people talk about. It's in that weird genre of radioactive, mutated, mutant creatures that Basket Case, Chad, and a few other things fall into. Yeah, and if you're, in, like, like the other one, if you're into that sort of thing, you'll want to check out that sort of subgenre, do check out Chad. It's a good start. And I, I think it's more commercial than Basket Case, so I think this is going to be the more accessible alligator one. Alligator as well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> That's slightly off. Um, I would say this is the more sort of commercially accessible of the two. I think if you want to be disturbed, <laughs> watch Basket Case. But if you just want to be sort of entertained, watch Chud. But they're both decent films. Um, it's a thumbs up from me. It's a Chud's up from me. Yeah, it's a thumbs up for me, I think. So you prefer this one to Basket Case? Yeah. What What I'll say is, my sign-off for the, both of these really is, with such low budgets, they really did it's a great job. Um, and horror films didn't do didn't make loads of money at this time but on video they did and both of these did great on rental and pirate probably um and i think they for me revisiting them after many many years they kind of still hold up well they've got a lot to say about society government mutation that kind of stuff and even family stuff in basket case um and they're surprisingly entertaining still um which do I prefer? It's difficult to say. I've always loved Chud, but actually I think I slightly prefer Basket Case. Just for... I get the same sensation as when I watch like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something a bit grimy, you know? And you're like, oh, why did I watch that? <laughs> Fair enough. But no, they're decent. And um, yeah, check it out. Check out Chud. But the Chud is... A lot of people love that one. Yeah. Well, I probably I probably love that one more than Chud. I, I don't know now if I watch it again. I might be like, this is awful, but I probably yeah. would. Yeah. yeah. But I doubt if we'll ever cover it. But yeah, Chud. Big Chud's up. A thumbs Chud up. Chud thumb. Chud thumb. Pfft. Up it goes. Right. Let's get to the outro. A 
Yeah, we're back again. We're back again. Thanks for listening. Thanks for chatting with us. Share, like, and give us a rating. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you've got a basket with something in it, give us some of your raw sausages. Oh, pop them in. Pop them in. Fun episode. Um, one we've wanted to do for a long time talk these sort of gritty new york and there's a lot more of them out there there's even movies like street trash and all that kind of stuff that's out there frankenhooker is a good one and a fun one that i'd like to cover someday you know pretty sure street trash has been remade at the moment yes i i do remember something about that actually yeah by the same guy i think uh, no not by the same guy it's a it's a dude who was at, uh, maybe on the set for something it's a younger guy arse of age i think hmm yes well there we go so yeah fun episode been wanting to revisit these two for a while there are two movies that i don't often hear people talk about so i always love it when we cover films that other podcasts or other shows don't really mention too often and we've still got so many classics to come uh talking of which should we talk about what's the what our next few episodes are going to be yeah please okay so for the next episode episode 145 we've got a little anthology special we're going to be covering the twilight zone movie from 83 and Cat's Eye the Stephen King uh, film from 85 uh, Drew Barrymore is in that one uh, so good good couple of good little anthologies there to talk about interesting yeah and then uh, after that will be our Christmas episode slash our 10 year anniversary episode this is weird which is weird uh, we must say that uh, only a few days ago it was 10 years ago that our Facebook page was created yeah. Which is nuts. Ten years that's been going. If anybody does want to send a message in, we we shall play it if you wish to, you know. Yeah, or even just write something and we'll read it out. I will be putting the reminders out as we Ten enter years. enter closer weird. to that. Yes, it is really weird. Longer than some people have had jobs. Um so yeah, we'll be covering National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation for that one because we both love that movie and it's Christmas and it's our ten year anniversary, so screw it. That'll be a fun one. And then we'll talk all things Christmassy and we'll probably reflect on 10 years of we podcasting. we just doing one movie, Home Alone, yeah? We are. That's Not cool. Home Alone. What is it? National Lampoon's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and we can cover Home Alone as well. My favourite Christmas film. No, of all no, time. no, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, episode 146. And then that takes us into 2024. So the first, our first episode of that year, of next year, will be a patron pick. A p- 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 patron pick, pick, pick. And it's back to Matthew Godley. Oh, yeah. I never looked for that thing last time. <laughs> hey, patron pick, 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 pick. So, so for episode 147, our first episode of next year, Matthew has selected two very different films. We will be covering the, gru- the br- brutal and gritty British... Brutal? The brutal. There's a new word. We'll be covering the brutal British... Dirty, uncomfortable revenge thriller. Revenge thriller. It's called great movie. Dead Man's Shoes from 2004. Excellent film. Really good stuff. And he is, he's paired that one up with none other than 1980s Flash Gordon. Amazing. So that's going to be a hell of a way to kick off the new year. I was, I was only feet away from Brian Blessed a couple yeah. of days ago. Gav sent me a photo. He went to Reading Comic Con um, to promote Sanctuary Moon and sent me a selfie of him smiling. And in the background, there was a very old Brian Blessed at a table signing people's um, photos. Yeah. Probably shouting at them. Hopefully he doesn't die soon or go missing. Because last time I did that was with Julian Sands. I sent it to Sarah like that. And then he went missing. Julian Sands. And he's dead. Yeah. Rest in peace, Julian Sands. We covered your movie, Arachnophobia. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the that's Matthew's the episode day, coming up. Someone had put on a Facebook post, just someone, a horror, all the horror movies coming out this year, and I went, wow, not one isn't a remake. And and, and, um, and uh, someone went, what? Uh, I think trying to, like, question me, like I don't know what I was talking about or something. I don't know why, because it's very easy to see that. And I went, what? Arachnophobia is not a re- um, is a remake. I was like, yes, watch the original. It's great. So, yeah. yeah, I forgot they're remaking that. Mm. It's a shame that there's so many remakes. Or there. 
make another movie, spider movie, or make the same spider movie they're making and don't call it arachnophobia. Yeah. That's fairly easy. There's been a few spider films out. Um, Itsy Bitsy I watched recently. It wasn't very good, though. You know, I don't think anything really can live up to arachnophobia because it isn't a horror movie as such, although it is terrifying. It's a great movie. I, it's my just kids a, never want to watch it. I'm like, come on, it's one like, it's it, an accessible for kids one. Well, what's good about it is it's all wrapped up in a sort of family-friendly... Spielberg type. Spielberg type thing. But yeah. then it's a really creepy creature feature. It's such it's a good, a good movie. movie. Yeah. yeah, we covered that for our Spider episode many, 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 many years ago along with uh, eight-legged freaks um so yeah that's our next three episodes so yeah it's in, we're crazy that we're talking about it next year now um but yeah christmas episode then into new year then after that will be your birthday at the end of january and we already know now that we're covering the sorcerer and um studio 666 so i'm excited to watch that because uh, i haven't ever seen it so um you'll appreciate it because it's a love letter to 80s horror yeah, um, JC uh, is in it. Kind of well. in the same way, like Eli Ross doing with Thanksgiving, but actually more fun, tongue tongue in cheek, like really good gore at times in it as well. I look forward to that. I um, quite like the Food Fighters as well, well so that be Dave cool. Grohl's great in it, actually. Yeah, yeah, he's a pretty, pretty good one, actor one of in anything his I've band seen. Band members, a guy called Pat, is absolutely appalling, oh, really? <laughs> but it's kind of endearing. Okay, and it's obviously kind of wanna... sweet. One of those guys passed away recently as well, so yeah, uh, we yeah. can talk about that as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, all righty. Well, let me do some admin, um, and then we can say our goodbyes and farewells, if you if you may, if I may. You may. Oh, you may. <laughs> Before. Okay. Yeah. You can do may away. So, <laughs> thank you. May away. <laughs> say. Thank- say may I may. away. Okay. Roll around in the hay. So, thank you for listening. Make as always, out of clay. As always, we are the podcast on a haunted hill. We are a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Uh, if you head over to the website, which is legionpodcasts.com, you can find out about us and all the other shows that are a part of that network and all of their back catalogues. Yep. Ah, I said it. Hey. Now, we are most active on Facebook. Uh, We have a Facebook page, which has been running for 10 years now, we can say, which is crazy. Uh, So just go on Facebook and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. You do have to ask to be added now. Uh, That seems to stop the porn spam. So that's great. Uh, We no longer are getting that because I've made it a private group. But uh, as long as you're a real person and not a bot and you haven't been on Facebook just for one month, then I'll probably allow you to join. Not that I'm being a little Nazi, but I have to be careful because I don't want loads of porn spam everywhere um legion have a facebook page as well which is legion podcasts it's probably uh, self-explanatory if you want to message us tell us what you'd like us to do next or if you want to ask us a question give us some feedback you can either message me on facebook or you can email us at the podcast on haunted hill at outlook.com that's outlook.com Com. Wherever you're listening to us now is where you, where you can continue to listen to us. We're on most platforms, Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, uh, Podcast App, Podbean, and all the other bits and bobs. We're on Instagram, um, which I use mainly to promote the episodes, and I always attach a link to a little montage, uh, a little collage of the movies that we've covered for that episode. Uh, it's just the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. Uh, if you follow that, that'd be brilliant, and I'll follow you back. And, yeah, you can just... Look at the little the collages I've created and you'll have a link to the episode there as well. Um, and aside from that, we are also Deadbolt Films. Uh, so go to deadboltfilms.com or visit our YouTube channel. It's just Deadbolt Films. Right now, we have Star Wars Sanctuary Moon. Uh, we've got just over 9,000 views in just over two weeks. We're very proud of that project. Yeah. Please watch it. Let us know what you think. Um it, just watch it tell your friends about it your star wars fan friends your horror fan friends anybody who likes film anybody who likes you know st- um low budget filmmaking just, just tell people tell them to watch it we've done so well with it we're so proud of it <laughs> um 
And uh, we've uh, sort of updated the YouTube channel, so I'll have a little look around. It's a lot more cleaned up, and there's um, it's got like a few like well, other short films and some bits and bobs. Deadbot films are on Instagram as well. It's, it's just Deadbot films, um, so that's where to find them. And finally, we're also on Patreon. As mentioned, we have patrons who get a patron pick. I'll come back to that in a moment. So if you want to become a patron uh, and support the show um, in a monetary fashion and help us keep things ticking over um then that's brilliant and we would really appreciate that but we would still always do this even if we didn't have a one single patron we'd be doing this for free um but if you do become a patron just go to patron and type in podcast on the hill again message me if you can't find the link and i'll send you in the in the right direction if you become a patron you will get a free t-shirt you will get uh, access to lots of um well all our entire show back catalogue because i'm dropping one every friday um in order currently we just dropped episode 105 i think so i've been doing that for 105 weeks in a row now um you also get to pick your own show so every three episodes we will have a patron pick where the patron picks the two films and gives us a mini review or some interesting information about why they picked those and we'll read all that out and you get to wear the crown the crown for that episode and be the king or queen patron um and yeah you'll also get me reading out your name in a city voice which i'll be doing in just a moment gav mm. I so they, I think they always look forward to that. They do. It's probably the main reason. It is probably the reason. But yeah, even if you just want to donate one pound or one dollar a month, any little helps. It helps us to keep the show ticking over. Buy equipment, it's rent amazing. films, buy films. Yeah, thank you. Just, yeah, it's amazing. It, it really helps. is amazing. Yeah. Um, so as always, a big thank you to our patrons. So thank you very much. And I'll try and do these in a bit of a chud voice or a basket case voice. Well, I always, I always feel like I should say thank you. If I don't know what to do, so I'll stay quiet there and let you do it. No, you can say thank you after oh, each okay. one. Oh, okay. All right, fine. I, I never know. Okay. I quite like the way that that dynamic's built up. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank Gun Courier. Thank you. Matthew Godley. Thank you very much. I hope you guys can understand what I'm saying. Jamie Jenkins. <laughs> thank you very much. Kevin S. Fife. Oh, sounds like a big one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Sarah K. Thank you. Ben Shaw. Thank you. RJ McCready. Oh, thank you. And Lex Boo. Oh, thank you. There you go. That's my family of chuds. That's uh, how my family of chuds all sound. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you guys very, very much. Really um, appreciate it. Really appreciate you guys. Appreciate everybody listening, supporting, sharing over the last 10 years. It's been phenomenal and it will carry on for many, many more years, hopefully, to come. Um, I will be reminding you all on Facebook um, to drop us messages and voice clips and whatever else it is you want us to do for our 10 year anniversary because um, we did that for our five year, um, which only seems like yesterday, really. Um, that was what did we do for that one we did predator didn't we for that one yeah gosh that was five years ago now yeah so that's it that's it from us uh thank you very much everybody gav thank you dan thank me and thank you it's a good night from um my funny little brother who lives in a basket next to me and watches me get with the receptionist from my doctor's surgery oh red flag red flag it's a good night from Dan. It's a good night from someone I know that used to pretend someone was in the wardrobe watching him and his wife. Did you? Not me. Somebody else. It's a good I told night. that story earlier. Oh, yeah. It's a good night from Gav. And it's a good night from Chud. Oh, good night, Chud. Imagine if my name was Chud Bone. Yeah, let's not go there. Yeah. It sounds like a weird thing you do. Listen, guys, take care. Remember, check under the sewers, check in your basements, and check in your baskets of laundry. Check because there might, just be, there might just be a chud watching you have sex. Sniffing on your pants. <laughs> yeah. Watch out for basket cases and chuds. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.